Good afternoon. I am Councilmember Mark Traeger, Chair of the Education Committee, and I'd like to uh, thank everyone for coming to today's oversight hearing on physical education and athletics in New York City public schools. We will also be hearing testimony today on proposed introduction number 242A and proposed uh, resolution 85B, sponsored by Councilmember Reynoso, as well as two pre-considered bills, one sponsored by Councilmember Rosenthal and the other co-sponsored uh, by myself and Councilmember Kalos. I'd like to recognize the members of the educa Education Committee who are here so far, uh, Councilmember Rose, Councilmember Cohen, Councilmember King, Councilmember Reynoso, and Councilmember Borelli. And Councilmember Kalos is here as well, yes. Um, physical activity is an important part of education that has proven benefits for children. Physical activity contributes to overall health and reduces the risk of heart disease, stroke, diabetes, some cancers, and other serious conditions and diseases. In addition to the health benefits of physical activity, according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, increased physical education, or PE, time improves cognitive skills, such as concentration and creativity, and is positively correlated with standardized test scores and grade point averages. In addition, student participation in PE and athletics enhances students' self-esteem, motivation, and conduct. With all of the benefits that PE offers to students, I am extremely disappointed that many students are not receiving the state-mandated amount of PE. According to data provided by DOE pursuant to Local Law 102 of 2015, during the 2017-2018 school year, 76% of students received the required amount of PE, while this is a 5% increase from the prior school year, over 200,000 city students are still not receiving the amount of PE required by state regulations. That's about one-fifth of our student population in New York City schools. DOE's data shows that elementary students citywide are less likely than their older peers to receive the required amount of physical education instruction. Our wonderful council data operations team has mapped, if you look to the screen, has mapped the PE instruction data provided by DOE. As you could see on the screen, and which is also available uh, on the council website, you could see the number of students who are not receiving the required amount of PE. It varies by community school district. In District 1, for example, over 50% of students are not receiving the required amount of PE. Over half of an entire school district is not in compliance. The same is true in District 23, where over half of the students in the district are not receiving the amount of PE required by the state. I am alarmed by this data. We should all be alarmed by this data. Additionally, while the law requires DOE to share data at the school level, the DOE's report redacts nearly all of the school level information, so there is no value to that data. This defeats the very purpose of this report, which is to help identify the barriers to compliance and thus prevents the council and any other partners from helping our schools increase PE time for students. My bill with Councilmember Kalos, pre-considered introduction 2018-3359, and Councilmember Rosenthal's bill, pre-considered introduction 3358, each seek to enhance data provided by DOE on physical education instruction in schools. My bill requires DOE to report on PE curricula in schools, as well as professional development received by certified physical education instructors. Councilmember Rosenthal's bill requires the DOE to report on the average PE class size, as well as whether students with disabilities are provided with adaptive physical education or waivers from physical education activity, including the number of students receiving each of these options per school. These bills work to ensure not just the quantity of PE being received, but the quality uh, of the PE instruction that is being offered. Just as we see differences in the amount of PE time, PE time rec received by students across community school districts, 
We know that there is unequal access to after-school athletic programs and sports teams across our city schools. Today, we are hearing proposed introduction 242A, sponsored by Councilmember Reynoso, who has really championed this cause, which will require DOE to report publicly on the funding for after-school athletics, including funding for coaches, referees, athletic directors, equipment, uniforms, and transportation. The bill would also require reporting on student demographic information, athletic team requests, and athletic facilities used for after-school athletics. The committee is also hearing Councilmember Reynoso's proposed Resolution 85B, calling on DOE to ensure that all students have equitable access to after-school athletic activities and associated funding. And I just want to note, Councilmember Reynoso, as a former teacher, high school teacher, where we were fortunate enough to have an athletics program, a football program, uh, it did make a difference. It did make, it made a tremendous difference. Many of those students had an extra mentor in their coach and all their coaches and extra volunteers who would check in with me, making sure they did their history homework, making sure that they were prepared for their global history regions and the, and the regions beyond. So this does make a difference in our school. So I thank you for championing this cause. After the passage of the federal No Child Left Behind Act in 2001, schools nationwide placed inflated emphasis on math and English language arts because these are subjects schools are held accountable for. And that has led to a reduction in time and attention and resources to vital subjects such as PE, history, art, music, civics. Physical activity is a necessary component of health and wellness and PE and athletics should not be luxuries for our city's students. The current disparities are unacceptable and the committee is looking forward to hearing how DOE plans to correct these inequities. I'd like to thank the Education Committee staff, Beth Golub, Kalima Johnson, Jan Atwell, Caitlin O'Hagan, and Elizabeth Hoffman. I'd like to also thank my staff, Anna Scaife, Vanessa Ogle, and Eric Feinberg. And now our bill sponsors will make statements about the legislation we are hearing. I'd like to first turn it over to Council Member Reynoso. Thank you, Chair Traeger. Uh, appreciate uh, you taking the time to hear this bill. It would actually be the first time we hear these bills, um, but not the first time or, or that we've advocated for them. I want to first thank the students that are sitting in the front row here with the fair play shirts that you see in front of you. Um, we've relegated them to having to advocate and be civic leaders as opposed to simply uh, enjoy fair school sports. We want to thank you for the great work that you're doing and advocating for this work. So thank you. And I'm going to give you a round of applause. On, uh... So I am simply uh, an instrument um, that is looking to uh, make sure I amplify their voices um, here today. So while I thank you for calling me the leader of this legislation, it truly is the students. So thank you again. Uh, my name is Antonio Reynoso, and I am the council member of the 34th district representing Williamsburg and Bushwick in Brooklyn and Ridgewood in Queens. I want to thank our education chair again, uh, Council Member Traeger, for calling today's important hearing. In 1954, the Supreme Court ruled that separate but equal was unconstitutional. That was 68 years ago. As monumental as this decision was for the civil rights movement, very little has changed in our country's school system. Our schools are still deeply segregated and resources are distributed inequitably. We are still separate and worse, we are still unequal. New York City schools are a prime example. Walk into many schools in our city and you'll find the vast majority of students belonging to a single race or ethnicity. In addition to the severe segregation, we are finding that resources to our public schools are not equitably distributed. Which brings me to my two bills that will be heard today, intro 242 and resolution, resolution 85, both of which seek to deliver transparency and equity to the Department of Education's process for funding critically important after-school sports programming in public schools. Why is transparency in this process so important? Through tireless research by a dedicated, a dedicated group of advocates, we have learned that there is a significant disparity in funding for after-school program sports, sports programs between black and Latino students and those students of other races. We have, a, we have a host of troubling statistics to prove this point. Please bear with me as I run through these numbers. Black and Latinx students are twice as likely as students of other races to lack access in any high school sports. 
17,323 black and Latino high school students attend high schools with not even a single PSAL team, more than twice the rate for students of other races. The average black and Latino high school student attends a school with 15.6 PSAL teams, while students of other races attend schools with 25 PSAL teams. From 20, 2012 to 2017, Schools with 10% or fewer black and Latino students had a 91% PSAL team approval rating, while only 55% of teams requested by schools with 90% to 100% black and Latino students were approved. In 2014, the most recent year this data was made available, DOE spent 14% less on the average black and Latino student than, on others, than students of other races. High schools with the lowest percentage of black and Latino, Latino students offer the most teams in the public school system. These numbers are troubling, especially when one considers the proven positive impact sports can have on a student's life. Kids involved in sports have a 15% higher chance of going to college. Our one-tenth is likely to, be, to become obese, have a decreased rate of juvenile arrests, teen births, dropout rates, drug use, depression, depression and suicide, with empirical evidence that sports can have a, transfor a transformative impact on a student's life why do we not do everything we can to ensure children have access to these opportunities? This question is even more pressing for black and brown students who are already facing the systematic racism that plagues our society. We know these are disparities in access to sports programs in our schools among students of different races. We also know that the Department of Education has a system for allocating funds to these programs that is driving these disparities. But there is so much we don't know about this system and how the decisions are being made that end up depriving black and brown students of equal access. For example, there is a total lack of standardized team granting process that, with criteria that applicants are aware of. Currently, the system appears to be entirely discretionary. <coughs> there appears to be no consistent rationale for denials, and we see that the denial rate for predominantly black and Latino students and their schools remain higher than schools with more students of other races. <coughs> Sorry. The current policy of prohibiting students from participating on teams any other school than the one they're enrolled in. Why must the team application process be entirely driven by the school's principal? Intro 242 will require that the Department of Education deliver critical information, including the funds allocated to individual schools for coaches, number of teams, and which schools have access to teams at individual schools and students access broken down by race. Our goal for today's hearing is to better understand that system, drill down on where the flaws are um, that drive these disparities, and develop fixes to ensure resources are allocated equitably. Intro 242 will ensure that the public can see how th this funding is allocated in the future to ensure all students in our public school system have access to these crucial programs. Again, thank you, Chair, for allowing me to read this lengthy opening statement. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Reynolds, and we certainly also want to echo his remarks welcoming the extraordinary students. This is the best civics class that you'll ever have, and uh, you, are, you are leaders, certainly, in this effort, and we thank you. I'd like to next turn it over to my colleague who is working very hard to make sure that access to PE is felt across the board for all students, um, and I, she has been a, a champion on this issue. I'd like to turn it over to Council Member Rosenthal. Thank you so much. Uh, Chair Traeger, I really appreciate your leadership on this matter, and I also want to thank Speaker Johnson um, on the issue of disability, where he's being a leader as well. Uh, so thank you for holding today's hearing, um, and again, for being a champion for children receiving the benefits of physical education. All students deserve the benefit of physical activity at school. Study after study shows that being physically active helps students and adults retain information better, <laughs> develop healthier habits, and lift their moods. And let's not forget how important it is to have a break in the day from classwork to be active. My bill, preconsidered 3358, which is being heard today, includes an additional reporting requirement about whether students with disabilities are being provided with adaptive physical education. 
with a deep dive into exactly how many kids at every single individual school that are receiving that physical education. Adaptive Phys Ed refers to a specially designed physical education program of developmental activities, games, sports, and rhythms suited to the interests, capabilities, and limitations of students with disabilities. Further, my bill will require the DOE to include a summary of key findings in its report, hopefully with what active steps they are going to take to rectify the situation. I again want to thank Councilmember Traeger for his excellent work in holding this hearing and recognize the leadership also of former City Councilwoman Elizabeth Crowley, who raised the issue during her tenure as council member. I'd also like to thank the Phys Ed for All Coalition, including the American Heart Association for their thoughtful and compassionate advocacy to make sure that all students receive appropriate and adequate physical education. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. And uh, next we'll hear uh, from someone I've, I've worked with as well on, on a bill that we, we've advanced together to get a lot more information than we have right now on the extent of compliance with curriculum and non-compliance, uh, Council Member Ben Kalos. Thank you, Education Chair Mark Traeger, for your leadership on these issues. Uh, as somebody who attended a public high school here in the city, Bronx Science does not have a football team. Uh, we don't even actually have a field to play outdoor sports on unless you count our campus where we'll play ultimate frisbee. It's not actually sanctioned, it's just what the kids do. Uh, and so when I became council member and representing the Upper East Side, I visited every single school in my district and uh, was shocked to see that we didn't actually have very many gyms in my district. I remember when the mayor asked to do the town hall at a gym in my district and when I finished laughing, I said, sure, we've got one or two and they're booked, so good luck. And so in so doing, we had a serious conversation with DOE and they informed me that the fact that we have classrooms that have mirrors on the wall, that those classrooms are in fact dance classes and that those dance classes uh, account for our physical education on the Upper East Side. And so I look forward to moving forward on this pre-considered legislation with uh, uh, Council Member Traeger and really getting a handle on what physical education looks like in different parts of the city. I also want to thank Councilmember Reynoso for bringing these kids out. And uh, I will ask the committee clerk to please add me as a sponsor to introduction 242A, uh, introduction uh, T2018 3358 and resolution 85B. And uh, we will work on this together. And Councilmember Reynoso has promised to help me get some gyms for schools in my district. So uh, thank you. and. Uh, I will have to step out for a meeting on land use, but uh, thank you very much for everyone's leadership. Thank you, Councilmember. I'd like to recognize the additional members who are present. Uh, as we mentioned, Councilmember Rosenthal, Councilmember Eugene, uh, Councilmember Cornegie, and I, I have to note because uh, he, he is still our uh, education chair and finance chair in a way because he's, he was a mentor to me through his leadership. Councilmember Drum really also helped lead the way to, ex to highlight the extent of noncompliance. I want to recognize his leadership and thank, thank, thank him as well. Um, I'd like to now welcome the administration that will be testifying and then we'll swear them in. Um, we have Lindsey Haar, uh, Seth Schoenfeld, Daniel Harris, and uh, Laquana cha Chambers. And uh, if, if you all will have the committee counsel swear the folks in. Please raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony today and to respond honestly to council member questions? You may begin. Good afternoon, Chair Traeger and members of the Education Committee. My name is Lindsay Haar, and I'm Executive Director of the Office of School Wellness Programs within the Division of School Climate and Wellness. 
thank you for the opportunity to update you on the progress we are making in improving both the quantity and quality of instruction in the core academic area of physical education. We appreciate our partnership with the Council and your leadership in supporting DOE programs dedicated to student health and well-being. The vision and mission of my office is rooted in this administration's core tenets of equity and excellence for all. We believe that educating the whole child involves creating conditions in schools where quality physical education thrives and where school communities are engaged in supporting student well-being. Research shows that physically active students do better in school and learn skills that can keep them healthy for their entire lives. Physical education focuses on teaching students why fitness and health are important and how students can develop the knowledge, skills, and confidence to enjoy a lifetime of health-focused physical activity. In April 2016, the Mayor and Chancellor, with the Council's invaluable support, launched the PE Works Initiative, an unprecedented multi-year, $100 million investment to transform physical education for our students, growing an initial pilot that reached 400 schools to a citywide initiative reaching all district schools. Our mission through PE Works is to create a sustainable model for quality PE instruction for generations of students to come. We do this by developing educators, both teachers and school administrators, who understand the importance of physical education and who have the knowledge and the skills to implement a strong PE program that supports students' fitness, health, and academic success. PE Works attacks the barriers and obstacles to quality instruction using a model rooted in the framework for great schools and adaptable to the unique needs of individual schools. We have completed individual needs assessments for, near, for nearly 1,500 schools to identify scheduling, facilities, staffing, and professional learning challenges in each school. Working with principals, we, cre excuse me, we create action plans and provide resources, support, and ongoing assistance as needed. By design, we have focused intensively on elementary schools, which needed the most support, but we are also providing expanded professional learning and instructional resources for middle and high school teachers as well as targeted support to secondary level administrators to increase the quality and quantity of PE in those grades. As a result, DOE's PE data released in August of this year show that schools report 75.8% of students met PE requirements in 2017 to 2018, compared to 53.5% in 2015 to 2016. That progress is reflected across all student demographic groups, boroughs, and grade levels, and stems from these key elements of PE Works. In collaboration with DOE's Office of Teacher Recruitment and Quality, and in partnership with colleges and universities, we have recruited and hired more than 450 certified physical education teachers who are working in elementary schools. As of June 2018, 85% of elementary schools had at least one certified PE teacher. Working with the United Federation of Teachers, we created a new K-12 PE license that makes it easier for schools to retain certified and licensed PE teachers in elementary schools. We created alternative pathways and supplemental certification options so teachers can gain PE certification. 139 teachers have participated in these options to date. We significantly increased professional learning options for teachers to help ensure that students have high quality, standards-based PE instruction. 78% of elementary PE teachers attended at least one professional learning session last year, and approximately 220 PE teachers participated in individualized coaching cycles to improve instructional practices. We created 31 teacher-led professional learning communities across the city, where approximately 360 educators come together monthly to share ideas and best practices. The number of these professional learning communities will expand this year. Building on PE Works, last year the Mayor and Chancellor, in collaboration with the City Council, announced a universal PE initiative to provide all schools with a designated PE space. Our work also includes engaging school communities in supporting a culture of high quality PE and student well-being. School wellness councils help to bring administrators, teachers, families, students, and community organizations together to tackle issues identified by the school community. Last year, we provided 207 wellness council grants. Physical education enables students to develop the skills they need to participate in physical activities of all types, including but not limited to competitive sports. Our CHAMPS before and after school program, funded in part by the City Council, 
was created with the goal of engaging students, regardless of athletic ability, in fitness activities that they can enjoy now and for a lifetime. Last year, CHAMPS reached just approximately 29,000 students in approximately 400 elementary and middle schools. Finally, the Public Schools Athletic League, known as PSAL, is another way in which we provide students with opportunities outside of the school day to further develop their physical fitness, character, and socialization skills through competitive athletics that foster teamwork, discipline, and sportsmanship. On that note, it is my pleasure to turn it over to my colleague Seth Schoenfeld, Executive Director for Educational Equity in the Division of School Climate and Wellness, who will discuss athletics in New York City schools. Good afternoon, Chair Traeger and members of the Education Committee. Before I start my testimony, I also want to thank all the students that are here today. Really appreciate your voice being in the room. My name is Seth Schoenfeld, and I am the Executive Director for Educational Equity in the Division of School Climate and Wellness. I am joined by Daniel Harris, Director of Professional Development and Special Projects, and Laquana Chambers, Director of Sports Programming for the Public Schools Athletic League. Since this is my first time before the committee, I would like to share a little bit about my background. I am a proud former PSAL student athlete, coach, and principal. Recently, over the last month and a half, I have been supporting PSAL's transition into our division. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss this important issue. The Public School Ath Schools Athletic League is America's largest sport school sports league and provides all league level support, including allocating funding to schools for teams, coordinating league events, scheduling competitions, assigning officials to oversee games, and providing funding for coaches, game officials, and uh, athletic directors. PSAL works alongside school staff, including athletic directors, who are responsible for engaging students, hiring coaches, obtaining equipment and uniforms, and locating space suitable for team practices. In addition, PSAL partners with organizations, su organizations such as the New York Yankees, New York Jets, and the Women's Sports Foundation to provide exciting opportunity for our school scholar athletes. These events include recognition dinners, championship games at major venues such as Yankee Stadium and Madison Square, Gar Square Garden, and special events for our female athletes on National Girls and Women's in Sports Day. In fact, tomorrow, the PSAL Football City Championship will take place at Yankee Stadium, where the number one seeded Vikings of South Shore Campus will face off against the two seeded Dutchman of Erasmus Hall Campus. Approximately 44,000 New York City students compete in 20,000 contests each year in 25 different sports, ranging from football to double Dutch. PSAL organizes competitions for approximately 3,000 teams each year, providing student access to after-school athletic programs. Research has shown that students who play high school sports have better educational outcomes, including, including higher grades and standardized test scores. According to the D Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, playing sports helps adolescents build and maintain strong muscles and bones and reduces the risk of developing obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. Athletic competition helps students learn important issues about teamwork, setting goals, and perseverance. This administration has promoted PSAL's work in four important ways. First, since school year 2013-14, the PSAL budget has grown from $28 million to $34 million, including $1 million from council, allowing PSAL to increase its reach by providing after-school athletic programs to 7,000 additional students, with approximately 400 new teams added to PSAL's roster. Almost all of these new teams increased access for students at schools with fewer existing teams. Second, PSAL has focused on expanding opportunities for female student athletes with the goal of ensuring that they have equitable access to after-school sports. These efforts have paid off. We are making real progress towards an equal number of male and female student athletes. Our most recent data show that females comprise 44% of our student athletes and 45% of teams are girls' teams. We look forward to continuing this progress. Third, DOE has, DOE has increased access to competitive athletics for students at smaller size schools. To that end, in collaboration with the City Council, we have made investments aimed at guiding smaller and newer schools through the process of growing a comprehensive athletic program. We look forward to building on the work done so far. Fourth, this school year, PSAL has expanded its portfolio to include management of the Middle School Basketball League. The Middle School Basketball League will generate interest in athletics in our middle schoolers while creating a pipeline for athletes to join sports teams in their high school years. Participation in the Middle School Basketball League is open to all middle schools. Any school can apply for a team. 
Our first priority at every PSAL competition and practice is the safety of our students. All PSAL coaches undergo health and safety training, including certifications in first aid and CPR. Coaches must also be certified in concussion management. Certification includes both an in-person course and an online component taken every two years. Schools must also provide automated external defibrillators at competitions and ensure that a staff member who is trained in their use is on site during competition. There are, spe there are specific additional safeguards to, for certain sports. For example, example, swimming coaches must have current lifeguard and CPR for the professional rescue certification in addition to regular PSAL first aid. We also have implemented measures such as pitch limitations in baseball and improved headgear for female lacrosse players. Providing all students with equity and access is a top priority of this administration. PSAL has recently come under the leadership of the Division of School Climate and Wellness, where we are focused on supporting the whole child, including social emotional learning and related supports. Under the leadership of Chancellor Car Richard Carranza and Deputy Chancellor Sean Robinson, we are moving the work of PSAL forward with a deep focus on equity and access to ensure that all students in our city can benefit from participating in after school sports. I would like to now turn to proposed legislation. Proposed introduction 242A requires DOE to report on funding for after school athletics. We support the goal of increasing transparency regarding PSAL and look forward to working with the council to ensure that the reporting requirements align with the data we currently track in our reporting systems. The pre-considered legislation sponsored by council member Schrager requires DOE to report on physical education curricula. We share the council's goal of ensuring that all students receive high quality physical education. DOE policy permits schools to select their curricula in all subject areas. And while we recommend physical education curricula, we do not track school level use. We are rolling out a scope and sequence this year to establish shared expectations for PE instruction citywide. The PE scope and sequence will assist teachers and administrators in providing sequential, developmentally appropriate PE that enables students to develop the skills and knowledge to stay active and healthy throughout their lives. We look forward to further discussion with the council on this bill. The pre-considered bill sponsored by Council Member Rosenthal requires DOE to report on adaptive physical education. We support the goal of this legislation. The DOE is committed to ensuring that all students have access to a high quality education that includes access to physical education and a wide range of sports. We are proud of our efforts and committed to continuing to expand athletic opportunities and support for our students. We look forward to working with the council on this important issue. With that, we would be happy to answer questions you have. However, at the directive of the law department, I do need to note that because of pending litigation related to PSAL, there are certain questions we will be unable to answer. Please understand that our inability to answer qu certain questions in no way reflects on how seriously we take our commitment to equity in all aspects of education, including athletics. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I just want to note that we've also been joined by council members Deutsch, Barron, and Rodriguez. I'd like the, uh, the council's data team, if they could point to the screen uh, to highlight districts 1, 23, if, if possible. Uh, for, forgive us if it's uh, not big enough there, but I, I, I think my voice will, will make up for it. Um, why is it that over half of the students in districts one and 23 are not receiving, and this is just, we just picked out these districts because they had some glaring examples of non-compliance, but why are over half of the students in these districts not receiving adequate mandated physical education time? Thank you again for the opportunity to be here and to answer questions. Um, this administration, with the council's support, has made an unprecedented investment in revitalizing physical education for all of our students. Uh, this is an area that um, has not been focused on for truly decades. Um, so we have a lot of work to do in terms of addressing um, the lack of PE that many of our students are receiving. Um, that being said, through the PE Works initiative, um, we are seeing um, significant gains in the percentage of students who are receiving the required amount of PE. And we are working very hard to ensure that we get to the point where all of our students are receiving um, not just the required amount of PE, but high quality standards-based physical education. 
Right, I would just point out that we're, com we're completing now, we're at the end of the fifth year of the current administration, um, and I understand that there's probably most likely been non-compliance for, for decades or for many years. However, actually, these regs that I'm about to read off, I think were last updated in the early 80s, uh, still no excuse. I just, I, I really think it's important that I emphasize and highlight this. I, this is a copy of New York State regulations. These are not recommendations. These are not suggestions. These are not just, oh, hey, I think you should do this. These are mandates. All school districts in New York State shall have the, the following. Curriculum shall be designed to promote physical activity, the attainment of physical fitness, and a desire to maintain physical fitness throughout life, attain competency in the management of the body and useful physical skills, emphasize safety practices, motivate expression and communication, promote individual and group understanding, provide knowledge and appreciation of physical education activities, make each individual aware of the effect of physical activity upon the body, provide opportunities for the exercise of pupil initiative, leadership, and responsibility, and reinforce basic learnings of the other areas of the total school curriculum. There shall, there shall be, there shall be experiences of sufficient variety in each of the following, basic and creative movement, rhythm and dance, games, perceptual motor skills, individual and team sports, gymnastics, aquatics where possible, lifetime sports activities, outdoor living skills, and other appropriate activities which promote the development of boys and girls. And there shall be opportunity provided for participation in appropriate extra class activities. There shall be activities adapted to meet the needs of pupils who are temporarily or permanently unable to participate in the regular program of physical education. Adaptive physical education programs, as my colleague, Councilman Rosenthal, noted, shall be also taught by a certified physical education teacher. These, were, these, are, not, these are not suggestions. These, this, this is the law. These are regs. And I just you know, highlighted two school districts where over half the students are being denied mandated opportunities. And aside from sort of the excuses of, of the past, what, what, is, what is stopping us from today making sure that we're full in compliance? Can you give us some more details? Why are we not in full compliance today? Sure. Um, I really love our state regulations, actually, and the parts that you just read, because I think it really speaks to what we are trying to do in establishing uh, physical education for our students. It really is about helping students develop the knowledge and the skills in a wide range of activities so that they can be healthy, active people for the rest of their lives. And that's going to mean something different for each one of our students. Um, and so in physical education class, we do want to give them that full, well-rounded experience. Um, you know, I think that the challenges that New York City faces with meeting PE requirements, which are not unique to New York City, they are state and national level, um, we certainly are not taking those as an excuse. Um, we are committed to, to changing this and to ensuring that ultimately every student is receiving high quality physical education. I think one of the things that is um, really important about the PE Works initiative and the investment that this administration has made and the support that the council has given to this initiative is that we're really focused on helping schools identify what their particular barriers are. Those vary from school to school. We want to be very solution oriented with the schools, um, with our administrators and teachers and help them whether it's around professional learning so that school administrators and teachers understand what a quality physical education program is, whether it is helping them with their scheduling practices so that they can make changes in their school schedule to ensure that they're providing the required uh, time and frequency of PE, um, if it's addressing facilities challenges. Um, that's really what my team and I are focused on, um, and I think we are encouraged that we've seen significant gains in the last three years with PE Works, and we are also recognize that there's quite a lot more work to be done and we're not where we need to be yet. Um, and we're not slowing down on that work. So I, I appreciate your comments, but I, I'm not actually hearing concrete reasons why we're not in compliance. And you mentioned facilities. Uh, section five of the regs mentions facilities. 
trustees and boards of education shall provide, not try to, but shall provide adequate indoor and outdoor facilities for the physical education program at all grade levels. So I, I, I'm just, I, I'm interested in hearing why we're not in compliance. I'm not getting to, I'm not getting that answer. And I'm also curious to know, we have to submit these district plans to the state education department. We're submitting, we're knowingly submitting plans to the state education department, knowing that we're not in compliance in these areas. What has been the response from the state? Have we received any correspondence from the state saying, hey, you have to fix this now? Can anyone speak to that? Um, so we do have, the state does require that every district provide a district uh, PE plan, and that plan is meant to be, to outline the district's policies and programs with regard to physical education. Um, the state also recommends that that plan be updated every seven years. Um, we last submitted our updated plan in uh, 2015, I believe, and we're going to be updating it again in 2019. Um, we've had conversations with the state about our policies and programs. They've given some guidance on those, and they are aware that we are working to bring our schools into compliance with PE requirements. Right. And, and I, I don't want to get take the state off the hook here either, because the state of New York likes to mandate things, but they don't like to pay for them. So I'm going to call them out as well. Uh, New York State owes New York City for a billion dollars, even even higher than that. Uh, and, and monies for, for many years. So they are, in my opinion, just as responsible because I believe that some of the reasons why you're not in compliance is because one of the reasons I think is because we lack the physical education space in our school system. Even with commitments that I've heard that in the past that we've made, we still are lacking the space. And that's just not acceptable. In a, in a budget of over now $90 billion, the largest school system in the country we have beyond a legal obligation, we have a moral obligation to do right by our students, and we're not. Uh, now, regarding the report on physical education required by Local Law 102 of 2015, in which we are hearing uh, legislation today to amend, DOE provides annual reports relating to PE instruction in schools. In this report, including the most recent report relating to the 2017-2018 school year, large portions of the data seem to be missing for certain community school districts, especially among demographic groups. For example, in community school district 20, all information about the seventh and eighth grade grades is redacted, including total student values. The report is also almost entirely redacted at the school level. Can you describe how DOE collects data on physical education provided to students to be included in this report? Is it based on information that is self-reported by schools, or does it come from the DOE system in which students are programmed for courses? How does DOE verify the accuracy of this data? Sure. So um, the, I will put a caveat that um, the office that oversees the data collection and the analysis is not my office, so I will speak to it as best I can, and if there are follow-up questions, we're happy to get back to you. Um, the data for the PE report for scheduling and compliance comes from the DOE system that's called STARS, and it is the Central Scheduling and Tracking System. Um, our Office of Academic um, uh, policy and Systems uh, pulls that data and produces the, the public report. I just want to note that a big basis of this hearing was about, uh, in addition to the bills that we're hearing, was about the extent of noncompliance on this issue. And I would have expected all relevant offices to be here today. And I'm disappointed that everyone here uh, was, was here. Uh, I am still trying to, uh, to get to the root of this. Um, in addition to a lack of physical space, what other barriers can you identify uh, that stand in the way of for full, full compliance? Um, I think one example um, that is worth talking about is historically the lack of certified PE teachers in elementary schools. And this is a, um, a component that the PE Works initiative has really been designed to tackle. So through PE Works, um, over the past uh, 
four years now, we've um, helped schools hire more than 450 certified PE teachers for elementary schools that didn't have them before. Um, that's a huge step forward. As of the end of last year, 85% of elementary schools had at least one certified PE teacher. So not only a dedicated person to provide physical edu um, education for students, but someone who um, is certified and has the training um, and with those teachers coming into the schools, then we've also coupled that with working with the schools to change their scheduling practices, to move towards ensuring that they're providing the required amount of time uh, for physical education. But it is my understanding that in elementary schools, physical education classes um, are not required to be taught by a certified PE teacher. Uh, it's my understanding that uh, what is required is to have at least one person in the building who's certified in PE. Is that correct? Um, yes, and we think the most qualified person to teach physical education is a certified teacher. So we want to make sure that every school has at least one certified PE teacher in the uh, building. And, and how many schools do not have a certified PE teacher? I don't have the exact number with me, but I can tell you that we did an additional round of hiring this fall, and we're at about 95% of elementary schools um, that don't have a certified PE teacher yet, and we're actively working with those schools to help them hire one. Did you say 95% of our elementary schools do not have? I'm sorry, maybe I'm sorry, no, do have. Do have. Do have, so we're, we're very close to getting a certified so PE teacher. So what I'm trying to understand is that if 95% of elementary schools have a certified PE teacher. Mm -hmm. Why is the problem so much more glaring in the elementary school level with regards to not providing adequate, enough, uh, adequate time? This is a very recent uh, change in development through the hiring that we've done with PE Works. So as of just a few years ago, the majority of our elementary schools did not have a certified PE teacher. So in combination with the hiring that we're helping schools to do, we're also working with them to make changes to their scheduling practices. And that's, to be honest, not something that necessarily happens overnight. It can take a little time. We're seeing um, significant progress, which we're happy about, but we're not happy about the fact that we're not all the way there yet. Uh, how does the New York City Department of Education define physical education? Uh, because, I, my concern, and this is something that I experienced as a teacher myself, um, is that because I believe folks are scrambling to meet compliance, we're getting, or the city is getting more creative on how they define physical education. Um, I recall hearing from physical education teachers during my tenure that they were being required to, for example, conduct more writings or journals or logs during physical education time. Or if you were in a classroom and you did some stretching, which is good, they would also rush to meet those minutes towards state mandates. You can call me a traditionalist in this sense, but I believe students should have access to a gym and not a gym that constantly has to be converted over into an, an auditorium or a cafeteria or some other space. Uh, they should have someone working with them that knows what they're doing, that's licensed and, and credentialed in that area. The mandates and regulations require that they should be provided with uh, even after school opportunities, whether they wanna have sports teams and different types of clubs, there should be resources towards that end. Uh, if what I've learned with the DOE is that if it's not really measured, it's not really funded, if it's not really being looked at, looked at no one's really watching this, and it's, they're not going to put resources towards these areas. So there are some schools that I know go ab above the mandate, but clearly the, over 200,000 students are not receiving the opportunities that are guaranteed and promised to them, and that is a problem. I have a quick question. Are schools allowed or permitted to take away PE class time as a punishment? No. Have we heard of cases where, 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 where that is actually happening? Um, I believe there have been a few cases where there have been questions that my office has received about that and we have followed up with the school um, to help them understand what DOE's policies are and frankly the importance of why we shouldn't be taking away PE class as a punishment. 
Mm -hmm. I just want to, you know, we, we're hearing anecdotally that that is occurring and that is something that is just not acceptable. And we need to make sure that we're, all students are receiving uh, their ma mandated services. I completely agree. And if there are specific instances that you or other council members are hearing about, I um, would be happy to follow up on those. Um, I just have, uh, I'm going to ask a one, one or two, and then I'll turn to my colleagues in the interest of time and to be courteous. Um, uh, how many schools do not have a PSAL team? I'm going to turn that over to Seth to answer that. Over the last, uh, since the 2013-14 school year, um, PSL budget has grown by $6 million uh, to increase access to over 7,000 additional students and approximately 400 new teams. With that said, I can't speak to the exact number of those that do not have it as it is subject to litigation. So uh, the number of schools that don't have a PSL team is tied up in litigation? Correct. Yeah, I mean, that is, uh, this is basic information that should be provided by, by the DOE. I don't think that that is uh, something that will get you in any more trouble than you might be ready in. Uh, but w we, should, we should have that basic information. Because another question that I have is, how many girls sports teams do we have in New York City schools? Um. So over the last, uh, since 2015, we have taken um, girl sports and that initiative to increase girl uh, teams as a priority. And 44% of all student athletes are female and 45% of our teams are girls teams at this point in time. But you don't have the data on how many? I don't have the exact number of. This, you know, as, as my colleagues obviously are going to hone in on this issue furthermore, but I, I just want to point, and you pointed out, uh, Mr. Schoenfeld, that you were a former PSAL coach and player, and, and, I, and I appreciate that. And, I, and, and your father is a respected coach, former Thank coach you. as well. Thank you very much. Um, I have seen firsthand the impact that it could have on a school community, as I mentioned before, the coaches in that entire sports, that coach, that the coach community were like extra mentors for those students. Some of those students who were at risk, who if they didn't have that sports team, I'm not sure uh, where they'd end up. And I just don't want that opportunity and that uh, experience to be denied to our students. And I, I think this is a, a glaring issue, as my colleague mentioned. Some of the communities that are, that are hardest hit by this issue are communities of color, areas that historically have been underserved in many other parts of their community, and they could least afford uh, this opportunity being denied to them. So I just think the DOE needs to think bigger than just mandates. It's not just the legal thing to do, it's the right thing to do. And I remind folks the DOE's budget with, with pensions is over $30 billion. It's a third of our entire city budget. There's just no excuse why this is not being provided to every student, to every, every school. Uh, so I am very disappointed that we are not getting adequate uh, information today. And the last question, I'll turn back over. Um, what is the time frame for New York City schools to be in full compliance with physical education? We are working on that. Um, I think we've, um, we've seen significant gains since the beginning of the PE Works initiative about three years ago. Um, I think it's important to note that even though not all of our students are getting the required amount of time yet, um, we are seeing an increase overall in the number of PE minutes that students are receiving as well. So we're moving um, and we're continuing to work as hard as we can um, to get all of our students the required amount of PE that they need and deserve. 
Right, but right now I believe the DOE mentioned that they're at 76% compliance, is that correct? I think um, as of uh, June 2018, in the um, data that was reported in August, it was 75.8. 75.8. Did the DOE set a goal for this year to um, increase their compliance to 100%, 95%? Um, we did not believe we could reach 100% compliance for all students this year, so we're continuing um, to work on that. Um, three years ago, we were at 53% in the city, so we are seeing those gains, and we expect to continue to see those gains, and we'll continue working with all of our schools to get to that point. So, but just to be clear, there is no, there is no set goal that we could hold the DOE accountable to right now? I can't give you a set date right now. I just want to point out that when I was a teacher, every year the DOE told us to set goals. We had goals to, to meet, to increase region scores, to increase graduation scores. I find it really interesting the DOE did not impose its own expectations on itself. Uh, I'll turn now to my colleague, uh, Council Member Kink. Um, good afternoon, um, and thank you for joining us today and giving us your conversation. I gotta say to uh, the starting five that's here today, Matthew and Mark and Lisa and Warren and Coach Rosen, thank you for your activism. Um, it's not new to you and, and you're true to this, so I appreciate you coming back. Because last year, um, we started this conversation early on with the Small Schools Athletic League, which is pretty much non-existent. And due to the advocacy of these young students, we were able to fight in the council to get over $825,000 to put funding in for after school basketball leagues and sports leagues uh, in New York City High School. So I say all that while I would like to give a pass in this conversation, I'm just gonna ask us to have a real conversation and being able to answer the questions without any type of other commentary because the only way we can get to the truth of the matter and come up with solutions is by getting answers to some of the questions that the chair has asked and that you're gonna hear the rest, the rest of us ask. My commentary to all of this, I was a high school basketball player and I knew what athletics did for me. I knew what it how allowed me to be a strong young man I am today, it allowed me to learn camaraderie and learn teamwork, discipline in the classroom and it stimulated me and motivated me to show up to school each and every day. More importantly, it gave me an opportunity to pursue my higher education because I earned the basketball scholarship. But when I say, what are we doing to our students today where we're talking about everybody doesn't have access to every sport that will allow them to earn a higher education. So when the Board of Edu Department of Education came up with small schools, a change of the dynamics, how they're gonna deliver education, they didn't deliver the whole process across the board. There shouldn't be some schools that can play lacrosse and some schools that don't have lacrosse. Some schools shouldn't have tennis and some schools don't, don't have tennis. Some schools can't just have the same three sports, basketball, football, and baseball, and everything else goes away. You're limiting access to these students, our children. I don't want people just looking at students because they're our children. They're from our neighborhoods, and we gotta do better by them so they can be better human beings. You've laid out what the system looks like, but obviously there's some flaws and some challenges in the system, that's why we're having this conversation today. So I'm asking you all, as you answer our questions, to step up and don't use the lawsuit as an excuse of not being able to deliver on an answer so we can figure out to help. Because the goal of this conversation is to help, not to say, oh, no, we can't, you know, uh, you know, because while the adults are caught up in the politics of the conversation, our children are dying in the reality of their world. So I'm asking us to step our game up in this conversation. So I do have a couple of questions I do want to add and ask of you. Um, because I, I, just, I just really believe that it's not discriminatory because some communities get it better than other communities. So I don't know, if, I want to think that the education system, the city and the state of New York, is not discriminatory. Am I naive to that? No, I'm not naive to it, but I'm just saying. My first question is that knowing that you don't, in some buildings, you don't have enough gym space, what has been your plan to accommodate lack of gym space so young people still can have access to physical education? That's one question. Second question is, what are you doing if you don't have enough physical education teachers? What is the goal to make sure that you have enough for your system? You mentioned 15% of your schools don't have it. So what happens to those schools who don't have 15% of qualified PE teachers? That's two. Next question I would like to ask is that, In schools that are co-located, whether it's a charter school on one floor and there's another school on another floor, 
what is the goal of how to allow them to utilize the space at the same time? I remember one of my middle schools, what they figured out how to do, when the, and I thank Chancellor Farina for this one. It's kind of downsized, so you don't have like five schools in one building, and everybody has a sixth grade and a seventh grade and an eighth grade in each building and in each school, and you just don't have enough space and time to get things done. So if you, how do you maximizing on co-location of different schools in the building and offer physical ed at the same time? Um, are we able to co look into co-mingling schools when it comes to PE? And what is a real commitment to recognizing that there are issues with, the, with your physical education system and what's your next steps to make sure that you resolve them? Okay, so I think I've got questions one through three, but tell, and I've got them written down, but tell me if I miss one. So the first uh, question I think you had was about space, physical education space. Um, so the mayor and the chancellor with the council's um, support in uh, spring of 2017, I believe, made a commitment through universal PE uh, to ensure that all schools have um, a designated uh, PE space. Um, so that work is underway, it's in process. Um, I think we, we recognize that there are schools that don't have the facility, don't currently have the facilities that we need and we're working to resolve that. I'm sorry, you said you know that there's some places that don't have dedicated space but you're looking to resolve it. So I gotta stop because I, I wanna get an answer that's concrete because if we're looking to only resolve what are we doing at this point right now? Because this, is, this issue isn't new for us to come with like we're kicking the can down the road. So I don't want us to kick the can down the road. What are we doing right now? We know there haven't been dedicated spaces. We can't build dedicated spaces in two weeks. So what are we doing right now with the young people in school who need PE training, who need activity? As we've all said, we know as adults, if we don't get a little, a little physical ed in, we can go crazy too. How does someone understand the fractures or, or at 10 o'clock in the morning or deal with something they have to deal with at home? If, when we know teenagers have aggression that's inside of them and the best way to do is engage in some type of productive physical activity. So how do we deal with that now? Not kicking the can down the road. I understand. So while the SA and, and the uh, Office of Facilities are working on those longer term, more permanent solutions, we're also working with schools to figure out what we can do now. In some cases, it's using a nearby uh, parks and recreation space. Um, it may be leasing a nearby space. Um, things like that. It varies from school to school, um, but we're certainly not saying that schools or students should be wait that schools should be waiting to provide students with PE until. Um, they have more space. We're working with them on an individual basis to figure out a solution in the meantime. Next. Uh, so I think your next question was about um, PE teachers and hiring and how we're ensuring that schools have these. So a big part of the PE Works initiative um, has been helping schools hire uh, certified PE teachers, particularly at the elementary school level. And a huge part of that work has been developing a pipeline for that because as you absolutely rightly noted, um, that's a big challenge. It's great to say we need certified PE teachers, but we have to find them somewhere and, and hire them. Um, so we have uh, pursued a variety of strategies. Um, we've increased recruitment working with our with the DOE's Office of Teacher Quality and Recruitment. Um, we've created a supplemental certification program so that existing teachers who want to get their PE certification can get that. Um, and we also created a Pathways to PE program. Um, it's an alternative certification for um, people who are not teachers now but who, who want to come in and become certified PE teachers. And we've seen a really um, high level of interest um, in those programs and um, to date we've been able to hire about 450 new certified PE teachers. Okay, that's two. All right, and then number three, I think you had questions about um, PE and space usage in co-located uh, situations. Um, so with those, um, you know, in in campus situations and where schools are co-located, uh, the principals work together to work out a shared space arrangement. Um, if there are challenges with that, and sometimes there are, um, particularly you know around PE space, um, my team will go in and provide technical assistance and help to try to figure out with scheduling and sharing the space, what solution um, can we reach to ensure that all of the students in all of the schools in that um, campus are getting their PE um, classes. Thank you for that. Um, but I wanna, I'm gonna ask one final question. And uh, uh, I mentioned to, mentioned alluded to this because we know that there's a problem with physical education and not being able to deliver it according to state mandates. Now, 
if we know that this exists and we know that children need physical education to learn, how and what is the learning model to implement physical education in the system? Just like children need to know their fractions, they need to learn how to read, history is part of the curriculum, science is part of the curriculum. How do we incorporate physical education knowing that the body needs to see? This is why I think that sometimes adults get it wrong, they're so caught up with the book knowledge, they forget about the developmental process. Our young people are going through physical development that requires them to spend off energy. And if they can't do that, it's a distraction in the classroom. It's a distraction in the building. So all the other plans that you put into effect go out the window because they're dealing with issues that you're not trying to address because you're trying to make sure that you deal with whatever the gender is supposed to be but not handling the developmental part. So my question is to what is the plan now, because we've already identified as a problem, to implement physical education as part of the developmental education curriculum? Yeah, well, I think, um, I think you framed it really well, and I think that um, there are a number of pieces that are already in process and some additional things that, we are, that we're going to be rolling out this year and in subsequent years. So first of all, I think it's ensuring that school administrators understand really what physical education is and why it's so important and understand what the learning standards are for quality physical education. It's working with teachers to ensure that they're prepared to provide developmentally appropriate physical education instruction for their students, that they know how to differentiate that instruction um, for students of varying abilities within their classes. Um, my office provides a range of free professional learning throughout the year. There are the professional learning communities that I mentioned um, in my testimony. Um, and this year we, are, we have a recommended curriculum and this year we're also rolling out a scope and sequence um, that provides much more detailed guidance to school administrators and to teachers about what students should be learning um, that is developmentally appropriate um, at various grade levels um, with the goal of, of ensuring that students are learning the skills and the knowledge they need around physical education um, that builds a strong foundation so that as they move through school, they're prepared to participate in physical education class at the next level, in extracurricular uh, physical activities, um, and things like that. Um, I wanna thank you for you, what you just said. I didn't wanna do the Charlie Brown thing, wah, 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 wah. But I'm just asking us in the school system, sometimes we got to keep it simple. Sometimes kids just want to run. Sometimes they just want to jump up and hit the ceiling. That's all sometimes we just need to do. We need to stop trying to be so super smart that we get it wrong because some of these young people are just saying, can I just go out inside and play? Can I just be a 14-year-old? Can I just be a 16-year-old? I'm asking us all, sometimes if you don't even have gym space, you can just call a session during the time of the school and create some space in the hallway and let them just jog up and down or jog around the floor, burn off some energy, something that's creative. If you don't have space, do you have the space? I didn't hear no other solutions other than we kick the can down the road. So I'm going I'm to pass the baton over to my, my colleagues, and if they kick it down the road, kick it back, okay? I want to thank you for your time, May. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you all for being here today. And we're going to get it right because we're, we're all here today together to get it right. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, we've also been joined by Council Member Gredentrick, uh, Levin, and Ulrich. And I just want to just note for my colleagues, in the interest of being courteous to people's times, because we do have also uh, witnesses that will testify after this uh, first panel, I want to put a four minute clock. I think that should be sufficient. Um, and I'd like to turn it over now to my colleague, Councilmember Cornegie. Thank you, Chair Terga. Um, and not to uh, beat a dead horse, but clearly uh, I'm a PSAL athlete. Uh, four years, uh, Queens champs, uh, all state, all city, blah, 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 blah. Uh, but the most important uh, aspects are what I'm able to do today. Uh, based on uh, my ability to participate. So I have a, a few questions um, that I'd like to ask. I, I played on winning teams and a lot of revenue was generated at gate sales and, and concession sales. And I'm kind of curious um, about where those monies were allocated. So uh, what are the guidelines around schools collecting fees for attendance at sporting events outside of regular school hours? 
How are those fees used? Do they supplement individual school sports teams' budgets? And does DOE track how much funding schools raise through these fees? Thank you. Um, the PSAL supports schools and teams by supporting, uh, providing funding for coaches, athletic directors, and game day officials, as well as a small, small supplemental um, OTPS for PSAL upkeep for equipment and uniforms and such. Um, in terms of the school by school funding revenue, that is not, we don't oversee that centrally. Um, and so we do not have those numbers with us. Um, do, you, do you feel as though, um, like myself, that there are monies being gener generated that could allocate and go back into the system to assist smaller schools? And, and even more importantly, what, what some of the money was spent, in my understanding, during my years was on teams that were less likely to be able to get access to resources. So we kind of shared the wealth a little bit as, um, as a dominant uh, athletic factor in the building with others, I, 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 would, uh, I would assume, you know, um, it was mentioned today, the championship being played. There are some schools that uh, uh, do okay revenue-wise, and is, is it the PSAL's uh, idea to look the other way or to have some monitoring system that has some equity within that, at least? I'll have to get back to you on that as I'm not, um, like, as I said, the PSAL budget uh, is comprised of city tax levy funds, a uh, million dollars from city council, and we appreciate that ongoing support. Um, and there is some vendor sponsorship, um, but we do not include in our budget uh, what's uh, raised at the school level. So how does the DOE determine the budget for each P PSAL program, and why does it vary so so widely, like so, our records show that there, you know there's a, a, a incredible deviation between budgets in particular schools in particular districts. So the PSAL pays for, as I said, um, coaches through per session, which is a UFT um, agreed upon amount per sport, athletic directors, and game day officials. Um, all sports, depending on the sport, um, get the same funding from school to school. Um, in some cases, when a new team is built, we, uh, they are put into a developmental program, um, which we hope that they'll transition out of within one year's time, but that has a slightly reduced schedule to allow the school to become competitive and build a roster over time so that they can find success when they, join, uh, when they transition to a full schedule. So that would only, the only difference in uh, per sport funding from school to school would be based upon um, that transition to a full schedule based upon the UFT agreement and allotted hours for coaching. Thank you. I, I think what we, you know, what I'd like to assert is that there are some uh, budgetary issues that we may need to discuss offline with, with this committee in, in terms of uh, why some schools are more successful than others, if there's no really way to mediate or uh, uh, revenues that are generated from, <laughs> from teams that you know, do really well or schools that do really well or that are very popular and that play a larger schedule. Um, so I, I'd like to have some further dialogue around that maybe offline. Absolutely. And I would like to highlight, and, um, as we've transitioned the PSL to our division, every policy, every procedure, every decision point, whether it's regarding budget or team allocation or otherwise, we are looking into to make sure that we serve the students the best way we can. And so I would be happy to discuss that offline with you going forward, as well as anybody else who's interested in that conversation. And of course, providing the opportunity for students and our school communities to engage in that. The idea of being a former student athlete is not lost on me. It changed my life. My father was a coach, but it took me getting into sports to change my life and put me on the successful trajectory I've had. And, I, and quite honestly, I went to Lincoln High School, and I took for granted what a what a sports program could look like or could not look like. And so every single policy and procedure will be reviewed and is being reviewed, and we will open it up for conversation to make sure we are doing the best we can for the cities, the students of New York City. Uh, thank you. I'll reserve the rest of my questions for the second round, if there is one. 
Uh, thank you, Council Member uh, Cornegy. I, I didn't have the good fortune of being a PSAL player. I did play chess at Murrow High School, however. And I, <laughs> that, that, that counts, actually. I, I, I hope it does. Uh, uh, I'd like to now call on uh, my colleague and a sponsor of the bills, uh, Councilmember Reynoso. Okay. And just um, your story and who you are, I think, could really help us in this conversation. But there are kids that are graduating from school right now that had no PSAO sports teams in their schools. So all that you got, they did it. Mm -hmm. um, and they're at a disadvantage because of it. And that's where we're coming from and trying to make changes here. Um, I want to ask, uh, every single school in the city of New York asked for a basketball team, every high school one. How do you determine which ones get the basketball team and which ones don't? Uh, so there is an online application which allows um, schools to um, request a team. If they request a team, um, we're asking uh, the administrator for uh, filling out the application to make sure that they can um, feel the roster that it is of student interest at that school and, and, and would be uh, highly engaging to the young people, as well as if they have a coach on site who would be able to support the program. Um, the team then reviews it, looking at various factors, including female participation, as well as schools with few teams. So, so everyone that wants a basketball team and meets all the criteria that you just had gets a basketball team. No, unfortunately, we receive um, over 250 applications a year and on average grant approximately 25 teams. So no, every school would not be able to receive a team. So how do you determine which teams don't get the team? I, I guess what I'm asking is who doesn't get a team that requested it and met all the, all the criteria that you're asking for? As I said, we are interested in, in increasing access for all of our young people. Um, and we want to continue to look at all the processes and procedures that allow us to do that. Unfortunately, I can't speak further to that or deeper to that uh, question at this time because of pending litigation. So there is a possibility that there is a team that meets all the criteria that you're asking for but will not get a team here in the city of New York. As I said, I unfortunately can't answer that right now. Okay. Um, is there a formula that the PSAL uses that determines, uh, to, that ensures equitability to make sure that everyone gets a chance at sports? Is there like something that you use internally to say, you know what, this school here doesn't have a basketball team and has been asking one for four years. This team has one, has always gotten one every four years. Maybe this year we won't give it to this school, we'll give it to this school, or maybe this year we'll just fund them. Is there a formula that you use to determine that? Um, posted online is uh, the criteria we're looking for to support teams, uh, but again, any deeper questioning on that matter I can't answer at this time due to current litigation. If a school gets a team this year, does it keep that team in perpetuity? We look to support teams um, to stay, uh, as long as they're meeting the, the basic criteria for supporting a team and fielding a roster, um, we would uh, continue to support that team. Going. So teams like Lincoln High School that you went to, because they have a long time here in the state of New York in existence, maintains all of its teams, and a new school that is to come up brand new might not get the same access to the team sports that you had access to in Lincoln High School? Um, can you? Lincoln High School has been yeah. in existence for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, it is not a small school or a new school. Right. A new school comes up, let's say the school of Danny Drum. Mm -hmm. uh, the school exists and it is asking for a basketball team. Um, you have to consider, uh, and it meets all the criteria that you asked mm -hmm. for. Mm -hmm. Lincoln High School will keep its basketball team where Stephon Marbury plays, right? But will the Danny Drum School get a basketball team if it meets all the criteria that you asked for? Over the last few years, we've been focusing on helping build programs at uh, newer and smaller schools. Um, in the 2016-17 school year, 76 small schools gained access to teams. Um, and in the 17-18 school year, 56 small schools gained access to teams compared to only eight at large schools. 
or you're trying to, so you're trying, so it seems like you're making an effort to build equity because you're giving more schools to small, more teams to smaller schools than larger teams. So in doing so, you recognize that there is an inequitable system that exists. As we've transitioned the PSAL to the division, we are looking at all the data and all the possible ways that equity and access can play a role in our, in our decision-making processes. We are looking to make sure that all of our policies and procedures do address access. We really want to push towards access for all of our students and all the students of New York City. Can I get the data that the Department of Education has uh, on who has, who has sports teams and who doesn't? Is there a way that I can get that and that be presented to the council so, I, that, so that we can look at who has it and who doesn't? Uh, yes, and I do believe that uh, council does receive that report, but I'd be happy to follow up with it, absolutely. And I'd be happy to set up time to actually discuss it as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I defer to uh, the chair, and hopefully there's a second round of questions. Well, just to kind of piggyback on what my colleague was just talking about, <coughs> according to the terms and conditions provided to the city council, there were 150 PSAL team requests that were denied last year. Are you aware of that? Uh, yes, we re we begun to review that data. And most of them were being told were denied due to a lack of funding. Yeah. Are you aware of that? I don't have the exact numbers on who got that uh, email, but yes, I do know that that is one of the reasons um, schools were notified for not receiving a team. Uh, how much would it cost to fund all PSAL programs that were requested last school year? I don't have that number in front of me right now. Um, I, will, I would like to add to that something, though. Yeah. I don't believe that we would be be providing the access that our students deserve by simply giving all the teams that were requested. I think that this is a much more robust conversation and much more robust opportunities for us to think about how we provide access across the city. We have some very successful models in our community-based model that provides access. We have campus models. And so just providing the teams to schools where the administrator applied, we don't believe is a uh, comprehensive enough approach to this and really want to take a more comprehensive approach to providing access to all students. Throughout right, but Mr. Schoenfeld, respectfully, remember in the beginning of my testimony, beginning of my commentary, I talked about the differences between mandates and things that are required and, you know, some folks recommending things. Let me repeat that this is one of the part sections of the regulations. There shall be opportunity provided for participation in appropriate extra class activities. Now, I understand that's a very broad statement, but the fact is we're not doing that for all students. So this is not just about a push for access, this is about a push for compliance to guarantee and ensure access for all of our students. I think this is, this is the issue that we're having right now is that we're not in compliance. And if it's an issue of funding, my goodness, we have a $30 billion DOE budget that continues to grow. I just read a disturbing, disturbing controller's audit about millions of dollars spent on lavish spending on posh hotels in Westchester. You're telling me there's not money for our kids in our schools for, to provide adequate PE? It's unacceptable. It's unacceptable. Um, so, it's not just we, ha we have to do better. We have to do better. I'd like to turn next to my colleague, Council Member Levin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I want to thank you for your testimony. Thank you for being here, answering our questions. Um, uh, I, the chair made reference to uh, Chancellor Farina's testimony in this, to this council in 2016 um, uh, regarding the goals of DOE's PE Works initiative, which was, quote, to move all elementary schools to compliance with state physical education regulations by June 2019. Uh, so I just want to be clear, are, or you could be clear with us, uh, are we on track to be in compliance with state physical education regulations by June 2019? 
Well, we're not quite halfway through this school year and we're working really hard on that. So um, I can't give you a definite answer on that. Um, that is what we're shooting for with elementary schools and also um, working toward, to um, ensure that ultimately all of our students are receiving all I, of the required PE. I, I hear you, but uh, you know, three quarters of the way or two thirds of the way through a plan, you should know whether you're on track to meet a particular target. Um, if we're not on target, it would be great for DOE to just say we're not on target. Are we, are we on target or are we not on target? Um, the public data that was, or the data that we reported in August showed we were at 63% for elementary schools. Mm -hmm. So we still have a lot of work to do this year and we're doing that work as hard and as fast as we can. But we're not on target. And I'm, so I'm, what has gone into if, if the chancellor is going to say that in 2016, she would only say that if there was a clear plan that could then back up um, uh, that type of statement. It's a public statement at a council hearing. Just in basic accountability would ensure that you can back up what you're going to say, especially when you're chancellor of the Department of Education. So if we're not meeting that target, uh, two two years into a three-year plan, why? What is? What has happened since June of 2016, or in 2016? What has happened since 2016 um, that has pushed us off target? I wouldn't say that we've been pushed off target, and I think we're when we'll be taking another look at our data when we hit the mid-year point this year. I think the challenges of this work, which is incredibly important and is really unprecedented, um, there are some real challenges. Um, as I've spoken about earlier, um, we had to build a pipeline for hiring and retaining more than 450 PE teachers. We're working intensively with schools to help right. them shift their scheduling practices. But all of these things we knew in 2016 when the chancellor made that statement. So I'm just wondering what has, what is, if we're not gonna be meeting the target, why are we not meeting the target? If we come back, I mean, we're gonna be, well, we'll we could have a hearing in June, I guess, to, 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 to see whether we have reached that target. But uh, something has, so, something has gone into uh, that. Uh, that is, I mean, I, I appreciate that, but, but is there, was there, was there a plan in 2016? A clear plan with, with, with uh, quarterly benchmarks? We've had a plan and we've been working on that with individual needs assessments with schools, individual action plans. Um, I think that, you know, quite honestly, we found that reversing decades of practice in New York City schools, um, has not been easy. It's required some time and a lot of work and we're committed to putting that in and to this investment that we've made. Mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't just happen in, in one year. So we're encouraged that we've seen significant progress, sure. but we're not there yet. I agree okay. with you. I have one other quick question here uh, with your courtesy chair. Um, has, has OMB weighed in on any requests from the Department of Education to um, to increase uh, PE budgets, um, uh, you know, when during budget time over the last uh, two budget years. Um, In other words, as, as, as have we made requests to uh, have, have we have, as do we made requests to OMB that have uh, that have been turned down? I'm not aware of that. We have our PE works funding right now, which is continuing. And um, we want to, you know, make sure. I think this administration has made its commitment to sustainable long-term physical education clear. I'm not aware of specific conversations with OMB, but so, so no funding. Every dollar that we need is in the budget. Is that right? I think. For, I mean, <laughs> that. I think that right now, yes, for PE Works, we believe that we have uh, the funding that we need to do this work. Um, the mayor made the additional commitment through universal PE for facilities. So also throughout the course of this initiative, as additional needs have been highlighted, um, the, the administration has, has taken a look at those. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll hear from Councilmember Rose. Thank you, Chair. 
Um, I, I think my uh, colleagues have asked um, some very important and, uh, and good questions. I'm not sure if we got such good answers, but I want to refer to um, Executive Director Har's um, statement um, and sort of come at this from a different direction. Um, we believe that, this is your statement, we believe that educating the whole child involves creating conditions in schools where quality PE thrives and school communities are engaged in supporting students' students well-being. Um, and I want to know, is PE a ma mandated? Is it mandated as part of the school curriculum? Yes, it's a state requirement. Excuse me? Yes, it's a state requirement. Okay. And so um, my, my question is, if PE is, is uh, educationally mandated and um, we have to provide this for them, um, why is it that we are um, building schools, and I know you're not school construction, but um, why are we building schools and allowing them to be built where they're not building gyms, they are building these shared spaces, uh, gymatoriums that are multi-purpose, and because they are multi-purpose, then there's not time, how can you schedule an entire school that's mandated to have physical education to utilize a space that is, you know, um, has many purposes uh, and not just for physical education. Um, it, it seems hypocritical to me that the Department of Ed is allowed to do this, and in schools where you have shared buildings, shared schools that are also sharing the same multi-purpose shared space, how are you supposed to, and how can you tell us that um, you're able to meet your mandate to provide physical education? You know, um, and, and you've talked about the value of physical education in terms of, of their educational growth and development. You talked about it providing uh, that all students are having, uh, have access um, and equity. How is it that you can make these claims when we have these, these schools that have um, these shared spaces that clearly um, programming, uh, programming must be a nightmare. Um, this administration has made physical education a priority, and that has been both on the instructional side, um, which is the area that my team supports um, through PE Works, and also through um, the Mayor's Universal PE Initiative, um, which is a commitment to ensure that all schools have designated PE space. Um, I think um, as we, as my team is working with schools, um, one of the things that we look at with them is how they can best utilize the space that they have, improve space sharing practices, um, and scheduling practices to ensure, particularly in those co-located spaces, that all so students are- how, So can you tell me um, then, if all students are, are getting PE, um, how much time is actually allocated to this, this physical education if everybody is getting it and we're using these shared spaces? Um, the state sets the time requirements, which vary by grade level. Um, in elementary school, it's 120 minutes a week. In middle and high school, generally, it's 90 minutes a week. No, we're not there yet but we're getting closer. Thank you. Thank you, council member. I just wanna note that we've also been joined by council member Levine, Lander, and Ambry Samuel. And next we'll hear from council member Barron. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the panel for coming. I wasn't here for much of the hearing. I had some other commitments, but I did come and I uh, heard a response that you didn't have the financial information. One of my colleagues asked a question. I think that's being ill-prepared. And if you were a student in the class and hadn't done your homework, 
and been prepared, you would not get a passing grade. So I think as a Department of Education, you owe it to this committee to come prepared, anticipate questions that we might ask, and bring the necessary financial information so that we can go forward with what it is that we need to know and what we need to do. So I would uh, ask you to do that in the future. Anticipate that we might ask a question about what is the total amount regarding any of the programs related to physical activity, that you could have that information and share it with us. Um, secondly, we know that there are obvious physical benefits to um, a well-regulated physical activity program, but there are also social benefits and intellectual benefits. And we know that cognitive functions also improve with children who uh, have a regular physical activity program. Their attention span also improves when they have a regular program. They feel better about themselves, they look better, they're not obese, and they have less of an opportunity or less of a risk for diabetes. So I would say that the DOE has contributed to the numbers of children who have been diagnosed with ADD, attention deficit disorders, and the number of children who are obese and the number of children who have type 2 diabetes in particular. And I would say that the Department of Education has been grossly remiss, and we need to correct the situation. Your timetable has not matched what it is that our children need to be able to have all of these. And I speak from the position of someone who was in the Department of Education 36 years. And I understood the value of physical education and made sure that in my program, I made the sacrifices in terms of programming to make sure that my certified PE teacher was able to share his skills throughout the programming of all the grades. You have a long ways to go, and we hope that at the next hearing, you'll be able to give us definitive information, data, finances, and tell us that you are, in fact, on track. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, next, we'll hear from Council Member Rosenthal. Thank you so much, Chair, and, and of course I want to associate myself with the comments of my colleague, Inez Barron. Um, I wanted to ask about uh, my bill in particular. I appreciate the fact that you support the goals of the legislation, um, and, and that's important. I wanted to know what hurdles do you think get in the way of implementing the bill, the goals of this bill? Or are you fully in support and ready to sign off on it? Um, so just to clarify, um, the, um, you're speaking specifically about reporting about levels of compliance specifically for students who are mandated for adapted physical education and also providing a summary of findings. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, yes we're, um, we're in agreement with that and look forward to working with you and, and hopefully being able to implement that for the next report. So I'm asking, uh, are you ready to, can we enact it or are there changes you'd like to make? Um, I think that I should um, confer with my colleagues in IGA, but I don't think that there are any major changes. I think this is something we can do, and we're certainly yeah. um, supportive of providing this additional level of information. I don't think there are any changes we need to make, but I would just want to make sure with our systems folks and our IGA folks that there's okay. no tweaks. What percent of children do you guess are um, in the category where they need phys ed? Um, uh, all students with kids, need phys ed. No, 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 with kids with disabilities. All students, with, all students need physical education. And one of the things that I think is um, really strong about the state's requirements is that there are no waivers for PE for any student for yeah. any reason. Let me word it a different way. How many kids do you think are getting? Uh, how, many kids with, how many kids with disabilities are there in the system who would, uh, who would be captured in this report? In the report, we should be able to capture all students who are mandated for adapted PE. I don't want to speculate right now as, as to what that percentage would be. No, I'm just curious, how many are there? I don't know that. A but million? we can follow up with you. Half a million? I don't have that number in front of me, but we okay. can follow up. Less with than 100,000? Okay, I get it. Um, 
So you'll, that number is, is gettable and you have it back in the office? Okay. And do you know where they are in school, pretty much? What schools are involved? And how much money do you think it would take to uh, renovate the buildings or um, change the programs so that they could have access to physical education? Um, that is outside of the purview of my office. I can't speak to that, but I'd be happy to follow up with you afterwards. Does any, do you think, does anyone, would anyone have that information? Has the budget office done a run? I would have to check. Facilities okay. are, are not my area, so I don't, I don't okay. want to speculate here. Thank you. I'd appreciate your getting back to the committee. Sure. Thank you for your help. Thank you, Council Member. I just want to also point out, uh, for the record, we talked a lot about what the DOE is mandated to do according to the state regulations. The regulations also state that all pupils, as we just heard testimony, all pupils shall attend and participate in the physical education program as approved in the school plan for physical education. So students are required. Students, in order to complete their full instructional program, students are required as well to attend what you're mandated to provide. We're, we're not even giving them the opportunity to fulfill the, full, the, really the fullness of their instructional program because this is required for them to receive their, their diploma and uh, to, to advance in education. So we're not in compliance with, with regards to the curriculum. We know that over a fifth of our students are not receiving uh, adequate time. We don't have an exact number today of how many schools have a PSAL program. We do know that 150 were denied last year because of money that apparently we don't have, but I'm pretty sure we do have. We're not in compliance with regards to facilities. There's, we have a lot of work to do, and, and I just have a question with regards to, I mentioned before, if something is not measured, it's not really funded or prioritized, in my opinion. Um, can you speak to whether or not when someone, whether a deputy chancellor or whether a superintendent visits a school to conduct, they used to conduct what's called quality reviews back in my time now, they might be called snapshots, I'm not sure. Is PE on that agenda? Is there a question on, uh, about how the school provides PE and what could the district or what could the DOE do to help support the school provide more PE? Is that, is that a question that's asked uh, to the local school community? I think you're, you've made a really important point about um, the importance of, of measuring and tracking these things. And I think that the PE, the annual PE reporting law, um, that the council passed has been tremendously important and your support of this has been tremendously important in terms of raising awareness about the importance of PE, the work that needs to be done and the investment that we've made as a city um, in, in moving towards having all of our students receive the required amount of PE. So I think the public report is, is one way that's really important. Um, physical education is on the principal's compliance checklist as well. Um, so that's a really important um, measurement tool. Um, and we also work with the executive superintendents, the superintendents, and the field support staff, or I'm sorry, field support center staff, um, to help ensure that they understand what quality physical education is, what the requirements are, so that they can be doing uh, their work with the schools um, as well. Right, so you mentioned that this is on the principal's compliance checklist. So if a principal, in conjunction with their uh, physical education supervisor, educators, make a request to the DOE, we'd like to have a PSAL team because we want to be in compliance and providing after school activities and we want to do the right thing for our students. Our, what happens then when, when they're being denied? Mm -hmm. um, so I want to um, make one point of clarification and then I think I'll ask Seth to address the PSAL question. Um, what's on the compliance checklist is, the, is physical education as an academic 
in-school subject that's required for every student every year K through 12. Um, that, is, that is a state requirement. It's not a requirement that every student participate in after-school athletics. Um, so, so what we're looking at the compliance checklist is that core academic requirement. Um, and I think and, and so, but just to finish question. that point, mm -hmm. if they don't have physical space in their building to provide PE, then how do we support that school? Yep. And sometimes that does come up. Um, and so oftentimes what will happen is the superintendent or sometimes the field support center or the principal themselves will reach out to us and say, I need some help here and we'll go in and work with them. It might be that there are some scheduling changes or some space that's available. Um, some schools, um, the uh, facilities uh, works with them to arrange for uh, leases of other space. So where there are those space challenges, we do work on those and um, for the longer term solution, um, the mayor's commitment through universal PE is, is in process. I just want to share with you just from my experience, and I speak to many educators still in service, my, my colleagues, I don't believe that this has reached the priority level that it should be reaching. I still believe that this is an issue, this is a, this is a subject and this is a, uh, an area that has historically, until this day, continues to be neglected by the DOE because there is such an obsessed focus on standardized testing and meeting other state mandates. I think the city is very selective in what mandates it likes to meet because clearly there's a lot of pressure from the state about certain test scores, math, ELA, and others. And I, I know that there's a national culture around that as well. But we, we can do better and we should be doing better. I keep hearing speeches and all these pledges of universal PE but we're still not universal. We're still not universal. And if it was an issue of budget and money, this is the time to tell us because we're entering budget season. And last year during budget season, no one told us from the DOE that, that we're short money for PSAL programs. It's an issue of how you spend your money. So it's whether, you know, first of all, we know that these are state mandates but it's also how you implement those mandates and whether or not we take it serious at the local level. And respectfully, as I mentioned in my opening statement, there's information in the report that's heavily redacted. We don't have school level information. We have some district wide information, but not school level information. So we're asking the DOE to work with us here. If it's an issue of money, this is the time to tell us. This council will aggressively pursue those money. I'm heading up to Albany with my colleagues, in, 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 you know, very soon to ask and to insist on more money from the state for them to meet, to, for them to pay their bills. But we need to know that the money is going where it, where it should be going. There should be no reason why any school with a credible athletics program request, th they should not be denied. Now, I also passed a bill recently with regards to transparency on PTA fundraising. Could anyone tell me whether or not can PTA fundraising money be used to supplement or p help pay for PSAL sports activities in schools? So we do not um, generally allow uh, PTAs to fund a team. There are certain expenses for all PSAL programs that rely on the school and the PTA m have the right to utilize that to support a program like with things like uniforms and equipment upkeep and things like that. But the uh, per session funding for coaches, athletic directors, and game day officials all comes from the PSL budget. But uniforms and equipment are not cheap. How, mu how much could that, could that cost on average? I would have to get back to you with that. I don't know. Yeah, they're not cheap because many students have to individually try to fundraise on their own to help pay for these things. And we learned that there are some schools that have the capacity to raise over a million dollars every year and I'm pretty sure that they offset costs for kids. And then I represent a community that has to start a GoFundMe page for basic school supplies, which should not be happening. So there's also inequities on how even monies that are, are raised privately. And some schools have alumni associations, other types of access to funds that many other schools in certain communities just do not have. So I think that we haven't even yet really hit on the, on the depth of inequity here. 
Uh, there will be follow-up on this issue because clearly we are still very far from compliance. I am not convinced today that the DOE is taking this serious at, at the highest levels because there's data that was just not here today, information that's not here today, people that are not here today. So I, I am leaving this hearing actually very disappointed and there are a lot of areas of follow-up that we have to we have to work on. Uh, do any of my other colleagues, Councilman Moreno? So I, I think you had a, you had a final point you wanted to make. Just uh, want to ask a, a quick question related to um, when a school does receive a, a team. Uh, the big issue I have is funding. Is there any possibility for a school to get an additional team when they already have many? and a school not receive any teams under your criteria? Does that, so you mentioned how many, how many schools, new schools got um, teams? Uh, in uh, school year 17, 18, 56 small schools gained access compared to eight large schools. So compared to what? Eight large schools. So the eight large schools that got f more funding than what they traditionally have, why did that funding not go to more small schools um, instead of denying 130, maybe you could have denied 122. Why is it not going to access to folks that don't have it as opposed to these larger schools? So, so first I would point out that just being a large school doesn't mean that they have a robust PSAL program either. Um, it just means that they have larger enrollment. So there are some schools in New York City that have large enrollments that historically have not had um, PSAL programming. So it's hard to determine from those numbers in themselves um, what your referencing there. So I'll, I'll give an example. Mur Murray Bertram is a school that's actually across the street from this building. They recently got two soccer teams approved last year by the PSAL. Uh, then we have a school called Bronx Leadership that, didn't, that got denied because of lack of funding. Why not just give Murray Bertram one team and give Bronx Leadership another and not give two to Murray Bertram and none to Bronx Leadership? How, does, how was that determination made? I would have to look into that specific example, but as I said earlier, as we transition PSAL to the Division of School Climate and Wellness, we want to recognize the opportunity, right? The opportunity that we have a council so focused on this um, issue, a mayor and a chancellor that have continued to push equity and equity now, and a deputy chancellor who has committed her work to equity and access for all students of New York City. And we are going to take that lens to every part of the PSAL. And we are gonna look through all of our processes, all of our procedures, all of our decision-making processes, including new team selection, as well as budget and otherwise, to make sure that we are providing the greatest level of access we can provide to the young people of New York the, the first step to that is admitting that there's a problem. And I don't think the Department of Education has come out and told us that there is an equity issue when it comes to sports for students in the city of New York. That's the first thing you didn't do. Um, and you haven't done. Uh, and if you don't think is there's a problem, it's hard to address it. It's hard to recognize ways to change it. So that's my problem. Another thing is that this chancellor has done a lot of talking, and I want to see him walk it. And that's a big problem as well. Equity is a great word to say. Um, actually dealing with equity is a whole different conversation. And this Department of Education, with the information we're getting now, not being able to achieve your own goals that you're setting forth uh, related to um, PE time, that's on you. That's not on anyone else. You set your own goals and you don't even achieve them. That shows us here and this panel um, on this side of the dais um, whether or not it's a priority. Equity has been a problem for a long time in the Department of Education. You guys say you want to do something about it. We're looking forward to the day that you finally follow through. And that hasn't happened here today and we're, I'm very unsatisfied with like, the presentation that was given here today. Um, there's a lot of talk, but not a lot of walk. Thank you. I, I appreciate that, and, and just in closing, my frustration grows because this is yet another area of the inequity piece that I continue to see in our school system. When the mayor says computer science for all, another universal pledge, when there are schools I visit repeatedly that don't have adequate wiring and bandwidth to provide internet even for the students that they have today, uh, when certain schools don't have physical education programs, when certain schools still have uh, outdated, antiquated infrastructure. This, there's a pattern here. And as my colleague, Councilman Reynoso mentioned, the pattern really hits home in areas that could least afford 
to be any further neglected. And I just want to point out as well that there's a difference between goals and mandates. Mandates are something you have to do, but we're not doing. Goals should be set. And I understand, and I, I want to say for the record, to be clear to the audience, the state has a big obligation here as well, because we're talking about the physical space. The states, when, when the state doesn't pay its bills to New York City schools, that d denies us opportunities to invest more in our school system. We're owed over a, well over a billion, maybe $2 billion from the state on past bills. That's a big issue. But at the same time, we also have significant resources in the DOE. We have to make sure that we're prioritizing key items. I, I keep hearing that PE is important, but we're not, the numbers are not matching up to that level of importance. So there's gonna be, there's gonna be some follow-up work here. I do think that the DOE should go back to the table and draw up some goals about further compliance. Because yes, I, I do note that there's been an increase in compliance, but we're still, over 200,000 kids, students, are, are still not receiving adequate PE time. That's outrageous. And, uh, and with regards to PSAL, um, it is, it is a, as you've, and I, I do appreciate, Mr. Schoenfeld, your, your commentary, it is life-changing for many kids. It's beyond the sports field or the court or the, the area, uh, the, the, the arena that the students are playing in. It is life-saving for students. In my school, a theater program was life-saving for students. These are the things that maybe superintendents or, the, or people from the state don't come in to ask about when they do their visits about test scores. But these experiences on and off the field are life-saving and life-changing for our young people. And I'm a big proponent of also social-emotional growth and learning. There are things that you learn on the field, on the court, that you won't learn in a textbook. Experiences, how to socialize, how to put down the phone for an hour and talk to each other and socialize and get to know each other and get to know people. That's, these are critical opportunities that our students are not being provided. So I, I, I kind of get the sense that when I speak to you, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir, but we need to make sure that the people at the top are getting the message and putting their money where their mouth is. And I thank the panel for their time. I'm sorry, Chair, I would just like to ask uh, the Department of Education, if you can stay and listen to the testimony of the students and not rush out, um, that would be helpful. We would have it no other way. Thank you for allowing us to stay. Thank you. Um, thank, we thank the first panel. And uh, the next panel we will call up, Lisa Parks, Matthew Diaz, Benji Weiss, and uh, Devon Wongley. I guess we'll start here, that's okay. <laughs> okay, it's on. Don't be nervous, this is all about you. You are leaders in this effort. Uh, and so take your, take your time and <laughs> take a deep breath and let's get started. Okay, well, I wanted to start by saying thank you for having me and everybody else that's here. Um, my name is Lisa Parks, and I am a student at Bronx Academy of Letters. I am an athlete. I play multiple sports, including basketball, soccer, and my favorite sport is track. I moved to the Bronx from Atlanta, Georgia, and I thought I was going to have track, a track team at school I was going to attend in New York and found out there was no track. It made me feel really disappointed and upset. It made me feel like I wasn't going to be able to play sports again. I didn't want to go to school anymore. 
In Atlanta, I came in first in all my meets, and I love when people like my mom cheered me on. It made me feel like I could do better and be better. It gave me confidence and built my self-esteem, knowing I could do something that I love doing. I'm thinking about going back to Atlanta just so I can run on a track team. I don't think students should have to go find a way to compete in sports outside of their school. It should be at all schools. I want every school in New York City to be able to play and compete in every sport. <clears throat> My name is Devon Longley. I am a six. I am 16, a 10th grade student from uh, Bronx Academy of Letters. Devon, can you just speak closer to the, to the mic? Sorry. You, you can pull it towards you. Oh, thank you. My name is Devon Longley. I am a six. I am 16, an, a 10th grade student from the Bronx Academy of Letters. While I'm, I am a, while I am an star artist, I am also an athlete. Sports has been in my life since middle school, though it's been limited to basketball and track track and field. I have never been able to explore other sports. I have heard that there are dozens of sports that other schools have that mine doesn't. Even though I am able to play baseball and soccer, I wish that my school had all the sports that other schools in New York City have. My love for sports makes me feel very badly for all the kids who go to schools with all sports. Many black and Latino students are limited because they don't have access to things that makes us free, the things that makes us who we are. Sports has always been in our lives, but basketball, soccer, uh, and baseball is what we've been linked to. Some may say that's all we need or just to be grateful we have any teams at all, but it's not about sports itself, it's about who's getting it and why. There are so many other sports that a school could have, swimming, tennis, lacrosse, wrestling, martial arts. There are so many things that, is, that we could have uh, that our other schools have. Um, I, want all, all <laughs> I want all students in New York City to have a large variety of sports that they could choose from. Hello, my name is Matthew Alexander Diaz. I'm a senior at Bronx Academy of Letters and I, I'm also the executive director of Integrate NYC. And also, I am the youth lead in the Fair Play Coalition. The Fair Play Coalition stands for the equal right of every public school student to have access to public school athletic lead sports. In New York City, there are many statistics that show an equitable distribution of sports. And you, heard, you have heard some. And I'm sure you will hear more of these upsetting numbers. But I live this disparity. I can personally say that my school has less than four teams when I was a freshman. But now I am supposed to be excited because I have seven teams three years later. But I know for a fact that at least one school in the public school system has 44 sports teams. And yes, that is a much wider school than mine. So my question has been, why is that allowed to happen? And another question is, why can't the DOE answer a basic question about themselves? Many students in the public school system have been normalized to having no sports in their schools, and that is not right for all these students. I represent all the black and brown students in the New York City public school system who want to give us an equitable distribution of sports and hold the people making the decision as to who, get, who gets what accountable for their discrimination. Intro 242 is a good first step to starting it to answer that many questions we have about the why the system is the way it is. And we look forward to speaking to you more about this issue on the Fair Play Lobby Day next week. We hope that the council will listen to our voices and pass Intro 242. Next week, we will be meeting with many council members, and we will pass on this bill. Thank you. Hello. Hello. My name, oh no, okay. That's good. Hello, my name is Benji Weiss, and I'm a sixth grader at BCS. And I am a middle school council lead for Integrate NYC. And I also play a sport, I play soccer. Soccer is very important to me because I love playing it, watching it, and I get more exercise as a result of playing soccer. And I think every student should be able to play the sports they enjoy. Now I will tell you why sports matter and why every student should have equal access to sports. The reason why sports matters and every student should have equal access to sports in their schools is because sports are a good way to get exercise, work on team building skills, and sports can be stress relieving. And we all know that school can, be, can cause a lot of stress. 
sports can also be a way for children of different races and religions to interact with each other who otherwise not, might not interact with one another. And sports can be a way for kids to get better sleep because sports can tire you out and make you more tired at bedtime. And scientists have proven that with better sleep, students perform better in school. One report shows that more than 17,000 black and Latino students have no sports in their schools. And one New York City Times article titled, In Schools Where Sports May Be Most Vital, New York City Offers Least Help, says that of 480 high schools, 67 have no PSAL teams, one, 100 have fewer than six. It also says the schools with the least access to sports teams have the highest number of students of color or for whom English is not their first language. It also says that there are schools in Staten Island with heavy white enrollment and they have 40 teams. So we should be asking ourselves, why isn't there sports equity? And we should be saying sports equity is vital to students and schools. And having sports equity in schools is one of the many steps to ending segregation in our schools. Thank you. So th this entire panel gets an A plus for, I mean, I think looking at the future city council, I think in a certain number of years, this panel will be sitting up here. Uh, that was very powerful, excellent informative testimony. I just have one quick question that, and folks can f feel free to chime in when, when I hear your thoughts on this. Um, how do you feel access to sports and sports teams and programs has impacted uh, your academic work? Has it, has it helped you uh, even concentrate, focus more? Uh, just curious to hear your, th your thoughts on that. Anyone could feel free to chime in. Um, to answer that question, I did play triathlon for my school, soccer and basketball. And while I, while I attended these sports, um, my attendance was a lot higher. Um, these sports teams required me to um, have one day to like study hall, like two days of, of the week we had study hall, so we had to do our homework. Um, and I think sports, in order to play sports in my school, you have to have a high attendance, you have to reach the bar, um, you have to have punctuality, you have to be you have to be there and you have to have good grades. And in order to play sports, you have to have good grades. And I think um, it allowed me to keep um, going my athletic career and also my academic career. Anyone else? Um, so I came from Atlanta, Georgia, and this is my second year here. And I didn't play sports last year, but I'm playing this year. And it's different because from Atlanta, they have every sport. We have, you can name any sport, we have every sport. So coming here knowing that there was only like four sports was really surprising. So I'm playing sports this year and my coaches do push me. Um, it's really hard to get up in the morning and get to school on time, but I do. And I look forward to doing that because I want to be on the court playing with my teammates. So, yeah. That's, that's a great answer. And, and, and anyone else? Or? Oh, can I ask you, Lisa? I want to ask you a question. I know you say you was looking getting back on 95 and heading back to Georgia if you can't get on the track team. I'm saying please don't do that. We need your advocacy here in the city of New York. And if they can't get it right before you graduate, I got a track team that you can, be part of, you can participate with, okay? All right. Um, I feel the same as these two. Uh, um, what I want to add on was sports has also made me, it also made me able to um, interact with more people. Um, if it wasn't for my friends asking me to join a team, I wouldn't like know the people that I know now. And uh, it, it really helped me out with stress. Um, you know, just it, it's, Sports is, has given me the time to like not think about work or anything. It's just to I just go to sport. I, I just go to practice every day to just play to you know to ignore everything else that's you know bad or great. Great answer, Benji. 
Um, so I feel sports can help you um, in high pressured situations like a test. Um, but also in my school, if you want to join the soccer team, practice is before school starts. So it, it requires you to get to school. Um, and that could definitely help students with their attendance. So they could be playing the sport they love and they could be doing well in school. I mean, th those are great answers and they actually validated many of my experiences. As I mentioned before, I was a former high school teacher before elected to the city council and I found it interesting that those students that were, some of the students that were on the sports teams, whether it was soccer, football, baseball, were some of the same students that were very active in leadership roles in the student government. They were very active in our theater program. They were active in all the volunteer uh, days, uh, assisting at, at a local hospital, assisting. I, I think there are so many more tangible benefits. Certainly what you do on the field or on the court uh, or, or any sport that you're playing, there are so many benefits, physical activity. But it does, I think it creates a stronger school community and a stronger community in general. Because in addition, I, some of the best events were the football nights when the whole community would come out to watch the game and to support the students, home, homecoming. That should be a part of a, of a, of a school culture and school spirit. And uh, so uh, I, I really thank you. I really thank you for your advocacy and for your courage to come up to City Hall. And because and, and, I know you're not just speaking for yourself, speaking for your fellow peers, your fellow students as well. So thank you very much. I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Councilman Rosenthal, who has questions. Thank you. I actually, Chair, I think you, you nailed everything I was just about to say. I was going to ask each of you if you would consider leadership positions in other activities. Um, because I agree, I think, or being a leader in your sport on the track team um, or on a basketball team, baseball team, soccer, whatever it is. Um, it shows real leadership to come here today. Um, and I, I appreciate you guys very much. And um, Lisa, you know, we do have internships available in my office. So I just wanted to. I'm actually doing an internship right now, so. <laughs> I mean, I could do two, so. <laughs> okay, it is, you know, maybe for next year. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Uh, Thank you. Thank you very much for, for your very powerful testimony. We'll continue our work together. Thank you very much. Uh, We've also just want to note that earlier we were joined by Councilmember Salamanca, and we'll call it the next panel. Thank you. Good job. Great job. Excellent. Uh, I'd like to next call up uh, David Garcia Rosen, uh, Melissa uh, Jack, uh, Jackin. Ayakin, I'm sorry. Uh, Mark uh, Dorman, uh, Dr. Mark Nason, and Christine Apa. Uh, Nelson Mandela, who would have turned 100 this week, said, sports have the power to change the world. It has the power to inspire, the power to unite people in a way that little else does. It speaks to youth in a language they understand. Sports can create hope where there was once only despair. It is more powerful than governments in breaking down racial barriers. It laughs in the face of all types of discrimination. My name is David Garcia Rosen, and I'm the Director of School Culture and Athletics at the Bronx Academy of Letters. 
The Public Schools Athletic League has run a separate and unequal interscholastic sports program for my entire 20 year career in the DOE. It did not have to be this way. We did not have to let generations of black and Latinx students pass through our schools without the power of sports. I have worked at three different segregated high schools over the past 15 years, and my students were denied access to the Public School Athletic League countless times at each of those schools. On the other hand, I've seen the power of sports with my own eyes. In 2011, I created the Small Schools Athletic League, and my school had a baseball team for the first time ever. Two students, Arjenis and Carlos, had pretty much dropped out of school. But when they heard about the team, they came to my office and said, we want to be on the baseball team. And I said, well, good, you have to come to school every day and start passing your classes. And both of them graduated on what was one of the best days of my career because I saw sports truly turning dropouts into graduates. The question then is why would the PSAL deny this transformational opportunity to hundreds of thousands of students over the past 20 years? Why would they give badminton and table tennis to schools that already had 40 teams while denying my kids their very first team? Why? Why? I, I just can't, I have a speech here, but it, it's like I can't fathom. I mean, some of these guys are sitting here. These are the decisions that they made. And I've watched these kids go through the schools without access to sports while at the same time watching these schools over and over with 30 teams, get 35 teams, get 40 teams, get 45 teams, while schools with zero year after year after year were denied one team. It is inexplicable why they would do this. And then why would they deny the problem? Continuing today, I mean, they're giving these, fault, these, these data that is misleading. When you come up here and say hundreds of teams were added, it's not acknowledging the depth and the gravity of the problem. When you tell the New York Times in 2014 that 90% of students have access to the PSAL, meaning that if you have one team, you have access to the PSAL, that is the data that these guys sold to the community for years. And the New York Times called it a statistical delusion. We'll never know the answers to these questions because the PSAL over the years has been a completely opaque operation, accountable to no one. They give out teams and athletic funding without even considering equity or the impact it's having on black and Latinx students throughout the city. In 2012, I gave them the research. I said, here it is, there, it's clear as day. And instead of saying, wow, this is a real problem, they got angry about it and denied and denied and got angry and denied some more. Instead of fixing the problem, like we are the adults in this room. Like we're all in here now. The PSAL is here, the council's here, we're here as advocates, the students are here. This is not like the rocket science to fix. Let's just fix it. Let's stop hiding behind lawyers who are sitting in the front row telling people not to answer questions. Let's stop hiding and start fixing. We can do it. It's, it. Let's just do it for the kids. What, like, it's just, it's time. It's time. Uh, agreed, well, it's, it's well past time, but agreed. Thank you very much for your powerful testimony. Uh, next, thank you. Thank you. My name is Melissa Yashan, and I am a lawyer, but I am here in the spirit of working together, collaboration, and transparency. I'm a senior staff attorney at New York Lawyers for the Public Interest. Thank you to Chair Traeger and the Education Committee for finally holding a hearing on the critical issue of after-school sports, the PSAL, and on Intro 242A and Reso 85. We are very grateful for Councilmember Reynoso and Councilmember King's tireless advocacy to make PSAL's decision-making on allocation of after-school sports teams and resources more transparent. And never before have we seen the need for transparency, I think, than today's hearing. NOPI has been working with students, organizers, teachers, and coaches in our public schools for many years to raise awareness of the severe inequity in access to PSAL sports teams and to change DOE's policies in order to ensure more equal distribution of resources tied to after-school sports teams. The problems with the current system are multi-layered, but the result is that the large, more integrated schools have access to many more sports teams than most small schools where the student body is predominantly black and Latino. Everyone has heard some of the statistics, but they bear repeating because we cannot allow the PSAL off the hook for perpetuating discrimination in the allocation of sports teams and resources. 
there are approximately 20,800 students who attend a school with no PSAL teams, and 83.5% of these students are black and Latino. Schools composed of 10% or fewer black and Latino students had a 91% PSAL team approval rate between 2012 and 2017, whereas schools with 90 to 100% black and Latino students only had 55% of their team applications granted. Black and Latino students have less access than students of other races to every single PSAL sport, with the exception of four individual sports, and those exceptions happen to be the least expensive sports to fund. I know many members of the City Council are just as outraged by these statistics as Nopi and our partners in the Fair Play Coalition and these incredible students are, including the co-sponsors of Intro 242A, which was drafted to bring more accountability and transparency to the PSAL's team granting process. We are here today to strongly encourage the Council to pass Intro 242A. We know transparency in reporting can make a difference because Nopi worked hard to pass Local Law 102 so the public could know how many students weren't getting the state mandated PE instruction in school. And with those troubling statistics public, DOE has made necessary funding available for, for PE and we were able to see the amazing maps that you all put together with that information. We need the same thing for the PSAL. Currently, the PSAL has sole authority to decide whether to grant or deny teams to schools that make requests without making any sort of standard decision-making criteria or scoring system publicly available. This lack of transparency and the lack of any publicly available standard policy by which PSAL makes its team granting decisions on their own would be troubling. But this is even more concerning when you look at the discriminatory results of the shrouded decision-making. My testimony, which you all have a copy of, goes on to talk about how this, this lack of transparency extends to FOIL requests being unanswered and really specific FOIL requests from the past three years continuing to be kicked down the road without preventing any data. It is clear that we do need this council to act and to really put the pressure on the Department of Education. It's our hope that today's important discussion sheds light on how cur the current PSAL systems perpetuate discrimination and disproportionately allocate DOE resources to the detriment of black and Latino students. We are looking forward to engaging with our council members further and directly on this issue next week when the students lead our Fair Play Lobby Day and we are able to see the council pass this important bill into law soon. We know that this legislative body can help bring more accountability, justice, fairness, and equity into the PSAL. Thank you. Thank you very much. And this hearing certainly has given us greater impetus to act very soon. Thank you very much. Next, sir. Um, thank you. Testing. Good afternoon, uh, my name is Mark Dorman. Uh, I'm a health education teacher and physical education teacher former athletic director, volleyball coach uh, in the Manhattan Comprehensive Night Day High School near Union Square. First, I'd like to thank the council for allowing me to speak. However, I'm saddened by the fact that I even have to be here. I've been in education for 30 years, 20 of which were upstate as a teacher, coach, administrator, and a charter school development officer. The last 10 years here in the Department of Education. When I transferred to Manhattan Comprehensive High School in 2013, there were no sports offered. Now I've been to several other schools, Bronx Letters, uh, Bread and Roses, and High School for Envi Environmental Studies. But, and they had limited sports, but this school had none. Students constantly asked me, why don't we have sports, especially soccer, since a lot of them are international students? I had no answer to that. But as a former administrator, I was well aware of the commissioner's regulations, which, and I do wanna make a correction, part 135.2 requires schools to offer PE including athletics and recreation. I called the PSAL to find out how to sign up. Um, I was told that our school does not qualify. Now you have to understand, I'm from upstate. Every school district in ups, every school district in this state on Long Island has these programs. It is unconscionable 
that they don't have them at some level, every single one. So when I came here, I thought, and I was told not to say this, but I really thought that I had dropped myself in a time machine to Mobile, Alabama. And I mean that. I was told by this person, a person, that do you really think that transfer school students deserve athletic programs? That's a quote. In 2014, David Rosen came to Manhattan Comprehensive to offer our school sports participation uh, an option, a sports, an option to join the small schools athletic league. I was thrilled. It was a highly functional league and we enjoyed participation until the money promised by Mayor de Blasio was, was not delivered, shutting down the league. And that's another story because I, I contacted the chancellor and emphasized this must continue, at least my sport, my soccer program that involved 300 kids. You cannot stop that in the middle of a season. And fortunately, she said to the PSL, continue it. And we did. However, I was told, you will never get soccer. So I went to the PSL and I had a conversation. And they said, well, it's just a transfer league and soccer is a, is a contact sport. I said, well, you know what? I'm not new to this rodeo. So is basketball and you've had it in the transfer league for years. So our demogra dra dra demographics in New York is changing. Get used to it. Soccer is huge. And so, and I went off the script a little bit, I apologize. After continued pressure, the students, athletic directors and coaches and the PSAL gave, gave, um, and gave, uh, gave in and, and developed their own small athletic school league, which included multiple pathways league, which we're in, I'm in. I became the athletic director, coached girls volleyball and boys volleyball. After four years of promises and pleading with the PSAL to move our soccer program to the spring, uh, from spring to fall for scholarship equity, the league has failed to deliver on promises of sport equity. My soccer boys, all dark skin, are some of the best, probably the top five, according to all the referees in New York City. We have had three or four full scholarships, yet we were given the worst fields in New York City and on Randall's Island. At one point last year, we were playing on the worst field. Next door, the private schools were practicing on one of the best. We've been kicked out of competitions, finals, because the time was up. But it wasn't, we were kicked out by the private school, 10 year olds who needed to practice. If we could just quickly wrap, because we have some follow-up questions to the panel. I um, thank you for I your do wanna, I, Can I, can I yes. please finish this up? I will finish yes. up very quickly. Yes. Facilities, both indoors and outdoors, that should be available to public school students are being upserved and to, by private schools, clubs, and other or, outside organizations. When I, when I inquired about getting fields, permits, and to practice, my, for my soccer team, one of the top teams in the city, I was told no perm permits are given to practices for public schools, only games. I did my research. I then asked why are the private schools K through 12 given permits to practice and play on public facilities, both state facilities and our city facilities. The response they gave me, they donate large sums of money. I'm almost finished. 
You cannot have sports teams without facilities, and this is important to develop our, our equity. 80% of the available venues in New York City's public parks are used by the private schools and the private sector. More disturbing is that hundreds of our middle and high school indoor facilities after six o'clock are being sold to the, by the city to the private sector, further, furthering limiting the opportunities for public school students to participate in sports. The percentage of public schools that have no soccer, baseball, basketball, volleyball, softball, and other sports is astro astronomical. The reason for, the, for, reason for not having available sports in, in the public schools is because private schools are using the majority of the facilities so, and something has to change. The fact that the private schools have greater financial resources should not negate the equality of availability for these kids. Our kids deserve better. We as a community are here to serve the public. We are a community that has a responsibility. We are a community that must do better for our kids and provide equity. This country is founded on that. The responsibility of equity rests on you, the elected officials. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. And I think my colleague, Councilmember King, has some questions. I'm just gonna take 30 seconds, not just to say a question, but I wanna thank David Rosen. I wanna thank you again for your energy and helping us spark this conversation over a year ago. Um, but I wanna say to the DOE that's still here, and just a close remark, and to the PSAL, so come December 26, the PSAL will be 115 years old. First game played at Madison Square Garden. What does that mean? That none of us was around when this was formulated. But we have a responsibility right now to knock out the kinks that shows the inequity that was happening in the world of sports. Not only in the world of sports, but in the world. Because we're telling our black and brown brothers and sisters that they're not worthy of what the Caucasians have experienced over the years, the greater opportunities and through education, through sports. So we gotta be better. It's your turn to shine right now. It's your turn to fix this. It's your turn to deliver, not to come up with excuses. Why? Because you didn't create this system, but you're managing it now. Are you prepared to step up to the challenge and be the champions that our young people need right now? That's my, that's my task to you right now. Throw the excuses out of the way, let's fix it and make the PSL what it was intended to be for all young people who want to get a good education through sports. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I certainly uh, share the, a lot of the, the passion and the feelings from my colleagues. And, uh, and again, I, I'm speaking not just as a council member or as a, as a politician, I'm speaking as a former teacher who is still deeply, very much invested in the success of students. You know, once a teacher, always a teacher. And I speak from firsthand experience the impact that these programs had on my students' instruction. Mm -hmm. um, some of them did not have mentor figures uh, during the course of their lives and their coaches and their assistant coaches and parent volunteers would check in with me about their attendance, about their scores. Are they ready for the regents? Are they ready for, the, I mean, it was incredible, the, the support system it created beyond the field. And so in my mind, I'm thinking about, yes, the actual sport itself, which is really important, and there's so many skills that come with it, but all the wraparound that comes with being a part of a, of a, of a community uh, that is so, and the coaches were incredible. Uh, their relationship, they reach, we, we hear the term in government, credible messenger. Sometimes a principal might not be able, or a teacher to connect with a kid like a coach can. And that's, I've seen that. And, and so, uh, and many of these coaches go uh, above and beyond even if they're even paid or wh what they're being paid. So I certainly so want to recognize it on the record. Uh, and I, I certainly um, believe that public facilities should be first reserved for our public school students and community. That, that is something I've seen in other 
areas besides sports programs that there are certain schools that uh, their space are reserved for other things other than for the students at night. And so I, I've heard that even in my district. Um, and that's something that I will certainly uh, follow up on as well. So I, I really thank you for, for your powerful testimony. And uh, there's no more of the questions. This panel is dismissed. Thank you very much. Thank you. And the uh, final panel we have here is Ben uh, Goliger, uh, Greg Mik Mikhailovich, Nicoletta uh, uh, Naranjas, and uh, Michael DeVoli. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Chair Traeger and the Education Committee. Um, my name is Greg Mihailovich. I'm the New York City Community Advocacy Director for the American Heart Association and also a former PSAL athlete. Um, American Heart Association is the nation's oldest and largest voluntary organization dedicated to fighting heart disease and stroke. 88% of, of which the diagnoses are preventable, which is why we prioritize uh, policies that promote child health. Um, and the American Heart Association uh, applauds the significant efforts that the New York City Council and Mayor de Blasio has made over the past couple of years, PE Works, Universal PE, and the significant progress we've seen over the past couple of years uh, with making sure every child has uh, PE. But as you said, Chair Traeger, we still have a ways to go. Um, one of the things that we're happy about is how we can accurately uh, track the uh, progress and identify the chronic areas of needs because of Local Law 102. Uh, and this law has dramatically improved the trans uh, transparency from where it was. Obviously, again, still work to do. Um, but as helpful as the law has been, we definitely feel it can uh, still be better. Um, the Fizit for All Coalition, of which the American Heart Association is a, a member, we have a wish list of school, uh, school level metrics that we would like to see as part of uh, local Law 102. I have it in detail in the written testimony. I'm not going to go into it, but uh, it touches on the quantity, the curriculum, student assessment, equipment and facility, substitution waivers, some of which are addressed in the, by the amendments that you, we're, we're talking about today, and we're thankful for that and your ongoing commitment to, to child health. But, you know, we all want the same thing here, and to use a sport analogy, let's swing for the fences. Like, we're here, we're talking about Local Law 102. Let's make it as best as we possibly can and get all this data that we want so that our kids are definitely getting the PE that we need. And I mean, preaching to the choir here, we all know that PE helps improve cognition, bone health, fitness, heart health, it reduces depression. I mean, this is something we all want for our kids. So, you know, we're here, we're talking about it. Let's, let's make Local Law 102 the best we possibly can. Um, additionally, in the current state, I mean, you've seen it, the Local Law 102, uh, the data comes out in these really dense spreadsheets, which is kind of intimidating for someone who doesn't do a lot of data analysis. Uh, the American Heart Association, we actually created infographics based on previous year's Local Law 102 data, and we use it as a, as a tool talking to parents, and it really resonates with parents and advocates when they can actually see the difference. So one of the things that we advocate for is having this data be more accessible. Uh, and be distributed to the schools and local languages so the parents and advocates, student advocates, they can actually see where, they've, where they were, where they've been, and how much further they have to go. So we definitely want to do, want, would like to do that, and we've attached that. Um, additionally, we also applaud the, applaud the effort of the council and DOE to make sure kids have uh, equitable access to after-school activities. Um, we recommend that children ages 6 to 17 should get at least 60 minutes per day of moderate to vigorous intensity physical activity. So the required PE minutes of 90 minutes to 120 minutes a week doesn't quite get there. So this helps bridge the gap of making sure they get the, the activity and these same neighborhoods that are lacking the school. Uh, lacking the schools are also usually the ones that have the highest incidence of diabetes, type two, you know, type 2 diabetes, obesity. So it really does uh, help a lot of these things. So thank you for your time. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. I'm Nicoletta Naranjas. I'm the founder and executive director of Run for Fun, a nonprofit organization that promotes holistic wellness in youth, um, mentally, physically, socially, and educationally. I'm also part of the PE for All Coalition, 
as well as the president of the Brooklyn uh, Chapter of Achilles, which is for disabled athletes, including children. I'm here today as a voice for my youth. Um, I, myself, was the power of sport saved my life from depression and anxiety. Um, when my son was born and he was about seven years old, he loved to play and run nonstop, just like so many of our kids, and, but feared com competition in sport. And I said to him on a run one day, Paniyoti, why don't you join a track team? He said, Ma, no, but I'll do it if you lead it. So that, that was an aha moment. That moment, I said, you know, that's not a bad idea. So I took him and about six of his friends up to the park in Prospect Park, Brooklyn, and started running games and taking them to races all over the city. That started something that I had no idea would grow into serving over 2,000 youth in New York City today. We, um, and many of what I found is in our youth, many of them had the same anxiety, have the same struggles with depression, have a lot of stress at school. I had one particular youth that couldn't go to school. He had stomach aches because he couldn't make friends on the recess playground. He didn't know what to do after school. He didn't have friends. He didn't make them well. His mom had to pick him up from school at lunchtime uh, because he couldn't make it through the day. Then I started recess at that school and then run for fun after school. And we ran on Wednesdays. He couldn't get to school on Tuesday, but Wednesday he knew he could get to school because he was going to run after school. And then the following week, he got to school on Tuesday because he knew he was going to run on Wednesday. And he made friends running in, in sports. And he had those same friends at school and could go to school in the morning. And his academics in, improved. And he could sit in class. He was then diagnosed with ADHD and learning difficulties. And sport has given him his life, has saved his life, just like so many. One day, I got a call from a, a beautiful woman from East Flatbush, from a middle school for art and philosophy, parent coordinator there. She said the past parent coordinator left and took the Roadrunners programs away, and we don't have them anymore, and my kids are begging to run every day. And I said, well, do you have funding? She said, no. I said, don't worry, we're going to find it. We have to find it. So I started a GoFundMe and brought Run for Fun to her school that spring. Then at the end of the spring, I didn't have any more money. She said, are you going to come back in the fall? I said, I don't know. I, I'll, I'll, I'm going to try. I'm going to try my best. I found a Nike grant that summer and applied for that grant. We got the grant to go back for the year. And then and the kids, she said the kids were, were going to school. They went to school because of sport. They loved running. We took them up to track meets, and they were able to, to have their behavior improved. The principal reported their academics were better. Their attendance was better. It was saving lives. It does save lives. We are also are in a school that does not have a PSAL team, a high school. And they called me and said, can you bring Run for Fun? PSL, PSAL continues to reject our asks for track and cross country team. So we're at that high school. But there, the opportunities that the PSAL gives them for college scholarships, the road for opportunities for the rest of their lives that they will not have because they do not have PSAL. They have run for fun, and we're so happy to be there. But they need PSAL. They need it, need it desperately. This is what we're doing. This is what I wake up every day, every day, and this is my life work, is to save our youth. And sport has the power to save lives, has the power to literally prevent suicide, to, to promote uh, self-esteem, to prevent child obesity and diabetes. Power of sport is real. And every day I wake and I'm trying to fill these gaps with tirelessly applying for grants and funding, and I should not have to be filling gaps. Thank you very much. Thank you for your, for your powerful testimony and for your advocacy. Thank you very thank much. You. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Chairman Traeger and the Education Committee for holding today's important hearing. Uh, my name is Ben Goligor. I'm here today re representing Asphalt Green. It's a sports and fitness nonprofit organization operating youth programs throughout New York City. This year, our organization is providing programs and trainings in partnership with 150 public and charter schools in some of New York's most underserved neighborhoods. In addition to keeping over 30,000 kids active at recess and teaching 3,500 kids to swim during the school day, we also run a community sports leagues program, which gives 750 middle school youth in Harlem the chance to represent their school in interscholastic competition. 
Through this program, we have seen how after-school sports can strengthen school communities, prepare students for high school athletics, and help children develop confidence and social skills. Over the last several years, we have had the opportunity to work closely with the Department of Education's Office of School Wellness Programs. We've taken part in the dis office's District Advisory Council and have collaborated to train elementary school staff on how to run active and inclusive recess periods. While there's still a lot of work to be done, we commend the DOE's efforts around improving and increasing physical education and physical activity during the school day. We believe Chairman Traeger's bill will further uh, help serve to further support these efforts and similar efforts in the areas of adaptive physical education and after school port parts for students throughout New, York's, uh, throughout New York City. For many years, Asphalt Green has provided adaptive phys ed for two specialized schools serving children with autism and general learning disabilities. We believe the Department of Education has prioritized the importance of expanding and improving options for adaptive phys ed and is working toward creating more opportunities for CBOs and other service providers to collaborate on making an impact in this area. Council Member Rosenthal's bill would help all stakeholders better understand where more support is needed and where successful adaptive programs are running. This will help raise the bar for adaptive phys ed and ensure every child develops the physical literacy needed to be healthy and active. We'd also like to voice our support for Councilmember Reynoso's bill to require increased report on, reporting on after-school athletic funding. After-school athletics are a crucial part of the safety net for children and families. With such a wide variety of agencies and CBOs acting as service providers during the after-school hours, more detailed accounting of the needs and resources of specific schools will help to guide how all of these organizations deliver services in the most equitable, equitable coordinated, and effective way. We look forward to continuing our work in the years to come and developing deeper partnerships with the Department of Education, the City Council, and other stakeholders to ensure all children in New York City can lead active and healthy lives. Thank you very much. Thank you as well for your powerful words and advocacy. And I just had one quick follow-up question with regards uh, to, uh, you mentioned before about the state mandates. Uh, the minutes are not even sufficient enough to meet the standards from the American uh, the Heart Association. That's something that obviously, there's not a state panel, but what is, what is actually the recommended time uh, I don't know if you have that with you, or I'd like to kind of get information, and I'm sure it varies per different grade level, uh, but is there a certain recommended time? Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, this is based on the, the latest uh, U.S. Department of Health and uh, Human Services, the Physical Activity Guidelines, second edition that just came out. Uh, but uh, children ages 6 to 17 should get, uh, you know, at least uh, 60 minutes. And kids younger than that should just, they, they recommend just being active, moving around. There aren't like specific minutes, but the idea is you get them moving as much during the day. Uh, we have a, obviously a, a lot more detail to that. I can get that to your office if that's helpful. And but, you're saying that, that this information was recently updated. How recent? Uh, two, two months ago. We, I mean, we just, we adopted this. I mean, um, I'll have From to see when the, the Department of Health and Human Services, but our standards, we adopted it. U.S. Department. Yeah, yeah, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Interesting, because the regulations that I, that I keep referencing during the course of the hearing are from the state, yeah. and it doesn't appear that they've been really updated since, like, the early 80s. <laughs> so, that surprise when, me. when I was born. Uh, so, we, we have a lot of work to do, I think, at the state level mm -hmm. and at the city, city uh, level as well. And, uh, and I'll just close by, by sharing that in uh, the school that I taught, uh, I'm sure many of you or some of you might have heard or seen the, the, the famous uh, Broadway play Hamilton. Uh, one, of, uh, one of the students that I had the uh, uh, pleasure of working with, uh, he was never in my class, but I would, would volunteer in the school and he was very active in, in, in school, was Anthony Ramos, uh, who was, a, was one of the stars of, of Hamilton. And he shared his story about the impact of the baseball team that he was a member of in the school, and he developed these social networks from the team to he joined the, the theater program, which I'm very happy he did, and we're, I think the whole world is happy he did as well, but it was the bonds and the networks and the relationships he built from the sports team and from the after-school programs that really catapulted him. And of course, the amazing teachers along the way that, that, that he met. Uh, I wish I had our educators. But um, that's the impact. Um, and so we're fighting every student is, should be given that opportunity that Anthony Ramos was provided 
uh, in my school, and we're not going to stop until that is done. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. And uh, with that, uh, this hearing is adjourned.